very much. Welcome to the January 26th commission meeting. Let's start as we always do with Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance. First of all, I'd like to introduce Representative Summers. Thank you very much for being here. Appreciate it. For those watching via Zoom, if you do not send an advanced comment sheet prior to the start of the meeting, but would still like to comment on an agenda item, please do one of the following. If you are on Zoom via your computer, you can send a chat to the host with your name and the agenda item you wish to comment on. If you are listening on the phone, you can send an email to wgfvideo at yo.gov, making sure to include your name, phone number you're calling from, and the agenda item you wish to comment on. Okay, I would entertain a motion to approve minutes from the November 16th, 17th meeting. So moved. Second. Moved by Commissioner Lundvall, seconded by Commissioner Byrd to approve the minutes of the November 16th, 17th meeting. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. In case you don't recognize this guy, this actually is the director. You might not recognize him with that facial hair. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, Mr. President, members of the commission. Um, I've got a few updates here for you today, and I'm also going to, I think I'll start off here today by introducing um, a couple of folks that uh, are either that you may not know or, in, or are in uh, new roles. So first of all, I think that most of you know, this is Deputy Chief Edberg's last commission meeting of a 31-year career. So I've got a lot to say about him. I'm going to save it till the end of the meeting. Um, just, you know, just in case there becomes a reason for me to change some of my opinions during his last commission meeting, I want to save myself a little bit of flexibility there. So, um, but um, who we do have here is Dan Smith and Dan Smith is the Cody Regional Wildlife Supervisor who has now been appointed to be the interim deputy chief um, until we find a permanent replacement for Scott. Um, so Dan's here with us today. I think many of you have met Dan before. Um, and, and he'll be in that role until you hear until you hear otherwise. We also have our new communications director. You remember that uh, Rebecca Fitzgerald um, left here the end of December, and we are very fortunate to have Nish Gokalia, who's right over here, mm. as our new communications director. She came to us from she was the executive director of the Pro Professional Teaching Standards Board, and so not new to state government, but certainly in a new role and. Um, she, she comes with a lot of diverse background, um, a lot of great qualifications, and we look really forward to working with Nish in her new role. Um, a few, few quick updates. So many of you have heard or may not have heard that there was a, a CWD bill that was passed out of the House. Um, I'm talking about the U.S. House. Um, we've, for the, for the last couple of years, when we've looked at what the costs are, be able to do large scale CWD research. We've realized that it's not something any one state can probably bear the cost of. And so we've been talking with our delegation about um, finding some federal money that could help us get a start. Anyway, this, this bill that's now passed the house has 70 million in it annually for management and research um, through 2028. Now it's gotta get passed out of the Senate. We have had, speaking of the, um, the federal government, we did have an opportunity here recently to meet with um, folks, senior um, leaders and officials from both USDA and the Department of Interior. They came out to Wyoming in early December. We showed them around a little bit. They're, they're interested in, um, they, they've got funding that they wanna to put towards conservation in states. They like Wyoming. Um, they're interested in migration corridors. And now after visiting here and having multiple discussions with Deputy Director Bruce and I, um, the governor's office and other members of the cabinet, um, they're interested in doing some work in other parts of the state as well. So we've, there's a lot of details left to be worked out. I just actually took a lot of these ideas out to our field personnel here a couple of days ago and 
waiting on some feedback from them. But I think there's going to be some real opportunities to do some work on the ground, <coughs> specifically with kind of a newer concept um, with habitat leasing, where we, um, instead of, you know, look at perpetual easements that we have more termed leases that where, where private landowners that have critical habitats in a migration corridor um, are compensated to not develop those lands. We also have the same kind of a potential. Um, we're looking at two pilot projects, one um, kind of with all three migration corridors that are designated as one pilot, and then something around the Cody area, um, one of the major drainages around the Cody area or some kind of a geographic feature that's identified by our local folks as the other place where the where there will be a pilot project to see how this works on the ground. The other two things that have been on the ground type work that we've discussed is doing more invasives work, um, mainly obviously with annual invasive grasses, but then also with doing fence modification not only in those pilot project areas, but really anywhere where we can um, identify a need. We have discussed that with limited resources, there, you know, folks that are engaged in the pilots and involved and have leases in the pilots could um, come out higher on the priority list for those other types of projects with fencing and, and um, cheatgrass. But, but we've been pretty clear and they've been, I think we're all on the same page that that could be applied to other parts of the state. Um, we've got some more meetings scheduled with them. Angie did one yesterday with them. Um, and we've got some more here in the next few weeks to kind of keep this thing moving forward. They are motivated and they do want to do this fairly quickly. And um, so we're, I think we're talking about, you know, announcements and, and having some things nailed down in the April, May timeframe. Um, we were able to get uh, Wyoming's grizzly bear petition to delist the greater Yellowstone ecosystem filed. Um, it's been received by the Department of Interior. We're waiting now for the 90 day, their 90 day finding where they will tell us whether they believe that it's worthy, that there's justification to move forward with the full status review and um, to, to come to a final decision on whether they should be delisted or not. Their other option is, is to, after 90 days, just flat out um, deny the petition. Um, I always, you know, the lawyers always tell me not to make predictions about things like this, but I am going to do it anyway and predict that the 90 day finding will, will be positive and will um, be just exactly what we would like. Um, I do, I did want to just let the commission know, as you recall, about a year ago, um, House Bill 122 has passed, and that was a, a bill that provided an increase in the conservation stamp fee and then allocated a portion of that to um, providing access onto uh, public lands that were um, hard or difficult to access. And, and additionally, a, a smaller portion of that 15% that would go to wildlife crossings. Um, the department has been working, identifying projects across the state that might be kind of the lowest hanging fruit or the highest priority, all eight regions. Um, have been working hard on, on identifying what those might be, and, and they're going through a prioritization process. Obviously, we don't have very much money in the pot yet, so we've got a little bit of time here to make sure we get the first several projects right. Um, we will bring, obviously, we'll bring those to the, to the commission and allow the, the public to um, see what we're looking at and weigh in if they would like. Um, I would expect now we're going to start having a fairly decent amount of money in that account by the middle of the summer. And um, so there'll be more to follow on that, but uh, I just wanted folks to know that um, we're continuing to work that and have some, some real potential here in the near future with that. So yesterday, Commissioner Doobie and I attended the Wyoming Wildlife Task Force. Um, great discussion, long day. Um, Representative Summers is on the task force. He was there as well. Um, we talked a lot about landowner licenses. We had a lot of discussion about um, our damage program. We had a presentation from Deputy Chief Edberg on that. Um, the task force had requested and we provided an update on, on wildlife crossings and where our priorities are today for those across the state. And, um, and then we had additional discussions about um, just kind of landowner issues in general and um, and 
challenges that we have on, on private lands and conflicts with wildlife across the state. Um, the, as you recall, there have been a few recommendations that have come out of that group now, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Our next meeting is, we're, we're skipping obviously the legislative session and we're not having another meeting until later in March. I think actually right before our commission meeting in March. Um, but I, you know, there's been one of the really positive things that's come from that task force from my perspective is we've heard from a lot of folks that we, we sometimes don't hear from. There's been a lot of public involvement. We've received hundreds of comments. Um, we've had people show up to every meeting and provide, um, provide their comments and some really good thoughtful feedback from, from the public through that process. The quick legislative update, you know, this legislative session is a short one. It's a, a budget session. And so really, I, you know, the legislature's time is gonna be um, primarily dedicated to, to approving the budget. And then also they've got, you know, once every 10 years they have to do redistricting. I know that that's gonna take a significant amount of their time. We've got a handful of bills that we'll be following. We've updated the legislative subcommittee right before this meeting today. Out of the Wildlife Task Force, there was two bills that were recommended and have been drafted. One that uh, for the big five, the grizzly bear, moose, sheep, goat, and bison, all five of those to move to a 90%, 10% allocation, 90% resident, 10% non-resident, and then also to make those um, licenses once in a lifetime. Um, so those those bills, we they're committee bills. We know they're at least going to get have a a fairly decent chance of getting introduced in these shorter sessions. Um, it requires two thirds vote in order to get them introduced. And, uh, and so obviously there's always a lot of bills that never even make for, never even survive first contact as you, as you might say. So um, <clears throat> another bill that was a committee bill was, um, it's an AIS bill that enhances penalties, creates a strict liability requirement for folks that um, bring AIS into the state illegally and introduce it into a water after they weren't inspected. Um, we'll see, we'll see how that goes. That was, there was a lot of discussion about that during the interim, but there, there is a bill. Um, we had our special commission meeting here a few weeks ago and we came and gained your approval to seek uh, a bill out of JAC to allow the commission discretion to invest um, your, your funds specifically, I think, our, our main interest was with the reserve account, the seven months of operating revenue into pool A, which is a higher return um, investment that the state treasurer makes. JC was very receptive. They had that within four days of your commission meeting, it was heard. Deputy Director Kennedy went and, and Meredith Wood went and testified on that. And uh, there's a bill draft and it, it, it's a good bill. The other thing that we're certainly um, tracking and watching is, is we know that the JC is going to have a discussion, the legislature is going to have a discussion on salary increases. This is a very important, um, this, this is very important for our agency. It's important across all state agencies, but um, it's been quite some time since there's been any adjustments to salaries. And as you've all seen, there's been inflation, both just with kind of everyday household good, food, fuel, um, those kind of items have, have seen inflation, but also housing costs across Wyoming have increased significantly. So we're watching that close and we are hopeful that uh, there will be a, a good solid salary increase for state employees. I did want to mention that this coming week, we've talked for two, three years now, we've, the commission agreed to make a pretty good investment in trying to help us become more efficient with how we um, do a lot of our fiscal business in, in the agency. Next week starts the budget process and we'll be able to test drive and use for the first time the, the budget module. Meredith and Melissa and that and the crew in fiscal has spent a lot of time entering data into this thing so that it can be used. But um, the initial impressions are that this is going to be a really good tool for us to not only be more efficient with our work, but be more frugal and be able to um, dive in deeper into areas where we might be able to save, areas where we might be um, have a little bit of slop in the way that we've um, budgeted in the past. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing how that comes out. You're gonna see the, 
the consequence of that work at the March meeting when you received a recommendation for initial approval of the FY23 budget. And then I wanna wrap up with, um, as you all know, I'm very passionate about our Inspire a Kid program. One of the things that we um, put together, our communications team put together was a, a Inspire a Kid um, top 100 checklist. And it's got, some of you've seen it, it's, a, it's about this big and it's got um, little activities. And when you complete the activity, you, you scratch off the block. And the idea is, is you try to get as many blocks scratched off as you can. We received some letters that I thought I'd read one from the uh, Jeffrey City Elementary School. And uh, this, is, this is pretty cool. So, dear Game and Fish Commissioners, enclosed you will find letters from the Jeffrey City Elementary student body. Yes, that's right, both of them. <laughs> I picked up a, 100, a Wyoming 100 sheet at the Spees Hatchery, and we have been having a great time scratching things off. Just before Christmas, they chopped and gathered firewood, built fire rings, and started their fires <coughs> without fire starters, no cheating, roasted marshmallows, and safely um, put out their fires. All of this was done on what we call our playground. The temperature was 17 degrees Fahrenheit with an average wind around 14 miles an hour. They earned those scratch offs, or they earned those scratch offs. Um, if you're interested, we have pictures. At the very least, if you put out a new version of this, we suggest adding a scratch off for dressing appropriately to spend extended time outside during winter. <laughs> Always a problem with students. Thanks for putting this out. I wish all kids in our state had the uh, home support to try and accomplish it. And then there's, there's a few of these letters like that, but uh, the, I, I found this interesting. One of the kids, this is Brooke. Her question at the end was, P.S., why is it called game and fish when fish are a type of game? Oh, it's interesting. So with that, Mr. President, uh, members of the commission, that concludes my director's report. I'd be glad to answer any questions or provide any other information. Thank you, sir. Any questions or comments? Thank you very much. Deputy Chief Edberg. Good afternoon. Commissioner President Doobie, Commissioners, Director Nesnick, next agenda item is item three. We're going to do some follow up, some previous discussions with the Commission about Chapter 28 in applicable livestock damage research um, and damage multipliers for livestock. With us today is the ever popular Dr. Dan Thompson, the large carnivore uh, section supervisor, and also Clint Atkinson the new uh, Pinedale large carnivore biologist to cover the Pinedale region. What we're gonna do here today is we're gonna give you two presentations. First one will be by Clint. We'll give you an update on some of the research that he just concluded for the past two years over in the Cody area. And then Dan Thompson will give a little update on how we got to uh, livestock multipliers today. And then some thoughts on where we're going with livestock multipliers in the future. And I believe um, Representative Summers also has some information he'd like to provide. So if there's uh, no questions, I'm gonna ask uh, Clint to come forward and begin his presentation. Thank you, Scott. Can we All dim right. these lights a little bit here? Possible. Thank you. Members of the commission, President Duby, Director Nesvik, thank you for the opportunity to present this update today. Before I start, I just wanna point out that this research was made possible to, due to a unique and strong collaboration between the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, UC Berkeley, Buffalo Bill Center of the West, and the light, some partner ranches we worked with in the Cody area. To start out with, I'll go over the, the general. To start off with, I'll go over the broad questions that we're trying to address through this research. First off, are there consistent patterns associated with grizzly bear and wolf depredation on the landscape? Which factors are important in driving these patterns? And factors that we're interested fall in three main categories including landscape features, 
factors specific to carnivore ecology and factors specific to livestock. How effective are producers at locating depredation losses? And this is in high relevance to our chapter 28 regulations. And what factors drive variability in calf and yearling survival, both at the individual level, but also across years. So to orient you on the study area, you can see Cody and Matitsi, Wyoming marked clearly on the map. The black line delineates the actual study area. Generally speaking, our study area encompasses the South Fork, the Shoshone River and Great Bull River drainages. In gold, public grazing allotments of interest are highlighted. And then our three partner ranches are also shown on the map there. Ranch A, B and C, we won't be using their names due to the sensitive nature of the work. So this research can be divided into two parts. This first part, we're leaning on an existing data set provided by the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. And our goal is to evaluate patterns associated with bear and wolf depredation on the landscape to determine the factors that are important in driving where that's occurring. Again, we're, we're looking at landscape features such as terrain ruggedness, slope, aspect, elevation, factors like that. Uh, carnivore specific variables. So this is carnivore densities, pack sizes, proximity to wolf localizations or territories, and also cattle density. Uh, and the ultimate goal here is to map depredation risk in the study area based on important explanatory variables that we'll identify through the modeling. I threw this map in just to give you an idea of the sample sizes that we're working with. This is the rare case where research like this isn't going to struggle because of a sample size issue. We have 113 bear depredations. Those are the pink dots on the map and 166 wolf depredations, blue dots there within the study area. To briefly touch on trends through time, you can see that grizzly bear depredation is cycling a bit more in the short term from 2008 to 2020. And we see a substantial peak in wolf depredation that coincides with a period of relisting when wolves weren't under our management jurisdiction. What? Yeah. Could you go back a second? I noticed between 2014 and 18, I realized regarding the listing of the, of the wolf, but there seems to be a dip. Uh, are they co in competition? The wolves and the grizzly bears, that's why you see that dip as the increase in wolves. Yeah, I, I mean, this is, this is a plot. I, I, haven't, I don't have the data to really answer that question. I'm just curious, because it seems rather, I mean, as soon as it hit, the grizzly predation dropped. You know, the wolves were eating grizzlies. <laughs> <laughs> There's just so many factors interacting on the landscape. It's, it's tough to say, just looking at a plot, we'd have to do more in-depth modeling to get at that question. Uh, the specific analysis I'll be using to look at this, I'll be looking at resource selection function models. Uh, this is a process commonly used to better understand habitat selection using movement data. And so we're going to apply this to depredation to better understand what we'll, we will look at known depredation sites in comparison to randomly selected non-depredation sites to better understand things or variables that are potentially being disproportionately selected for in a depredation site. I've been compiling covariates regarding this um, this is just a list of a few that I've come up with so far, terrain ruggedness, terrain position index, aspect slope, elevation, I have water layer for distance water, land cover. These are more of the landscape features or landscape variables we'll be looking at. Moving into the carnivore specific variables using VHF data collected by the department from 2012 to 2021, I've compiled wolf pack ranges during that time frame, And I threw a couple of example maps up just so you could see just how dynamic that is and how much it varies from one year to, the, to wow. another. 
one of the most challenging <clears throat> covariates to come up with so far has been wolf localizations. And so a localization being a den or a, a rendezvous site established by wolves during pup rearing. Uh, we currently only have data from 2017 to 2021, and we need this data back to 2012 to match up with our depredation records. So our mountain lion biologist, Justin Clapp, recently created an R package that looks at lo GPS locations from collars to identify prey sites or kill sites. And I have, I have been applying that cluster package to VHF locations, much more coarse scale data to try to identify dens and have had high success doing so. As of right now, I've tried 630 parameter sets and I've been able to predict dens from 2017 to 2021, 85% of known dens. And then of all the clusters generated, 85% are able to be verified as a localization. So I, I have found some success in predicting where wolf localizations have occurred in the past using this algorithm. And this will be useful in understanding how proximity to these localizations influences depredation risk. So I'll be continuing to work through covariates and hope to have modeling complete by April or May. Uh, moving on to our second part, this is a cause specific mortality study of bovine calves and yearlings. And so here we're evaluating factors that influence survival in calves and yearlings. Some variables of interest include calving timing, breed, sex, cattle grazing distributions, specifically the spread week by week, cattle group size and composition, neighboring cattle group size and composition, distance to wolf pack, range of localizations, management action, both relocation and removal, and we would like to build grizzly bear related covariates into this, though contemporary data is limited. And the second part of this is quantifying producer depredation detection rates, which Dan Thompson will talk about more in the next talk. So to accomplish this, we put out a large number of transmitters over the last two years, monitored those intensively twice a week. And as soon as mortality was detected, visited the site and determined cause of death. From 2020, well, during the 2020 and 2021 season, we've deployed a total of 1,055 GPS and VHF transmitters. A portion of those went on adults to help us understand cattle movements better, but also the distribution of cattle for modeling purposes. We've also, the, the vast majority of transmitters were deployed on calves, 723 VHF and 36 GPS but we also deployed 175 VHF and 15 GPS on yearlings in 2020. To summarize all the mortality picked up from 2020 to 2021. So the mark, the mark column, that's all of our tag, that's out of all of our tagged cattle. And then we have unmarked as well. So we had one wolf depredation in two years, two unmarked, we had 16, bear depredations in our tag sample, six unmarked, 10 natural mortalities, four unmarked, and then four unknown. And the percentage next to those numbers in the marked category, that's the percentage of all of the tag cattle that we intensively monitored over the course of two years. So, out of, so we have 31 total tag mortalities, that's 3.3% of our, our total sample. And we, out of all of those mortalities, we only had one yearling mortality. The group we monitored in that area and in that group, we had, there was a really good year, no depredation occurred. We did, however, have a natural mortality, high altitude sickness related. So these plots have a lot of information packed into them. So I will try to just cover the highlights. If you look at the, the far left bar, just as an example, the top number, that is the percent of our tag sample that died on that ranch due to that cause. The next number down is that total cattle group size for context. And then inside of the bar, that's our estimated loss based on the rate from our sample. 
And so you can see on Ranch A and Ranch C in 2020, their most significant source of mortality was from grizzly bears at 2.7 and 1.8%. That increased in 2021 to 3.85% on those ranches, or 3.85 and 3.7%. In 2020, the only year we monitored on Ranch B, their higher rate of mortality came from the natural category and that much of that was attributed to high altitude sickness. And later in the presentation, you'll see why. And we did, we did have some unknown mortality. So those numbers were reflected in the plot. And ranch A and C both had higher rates of natural mortality, or sorry, ranch C had higher rates of natural mortality in 2021. Moving on to producer detection rates in, 2020 on Ranch A, they detected one of an estimated 11 calves that were taken by grizzlies. In 2021, they detected eight of an estimated 27 bear depredations. On Ranch B, we did not detect any bear depredation. On Ranch C in 2020, one of an estimated six calves were found. And then in 2021, three out of an estimated 13 grizzly bear depredations were found. During both years of this project, we did not have a lot of wolf damage and that was largely due to low wolf depredation risk in the steady area. There wasn't a high presence of wolves at the time of this project. So we did not pick up any wolf depredation on ranch A or ranch C during both years. On ranch B, we did pick up one tag mortality caused by wolves. And it was a just kind of a roaming pair. They weren't a reproductive established pack. And shortly after damage began, we took those wolves out. But two out of an estimated 3.28 wolf depredations were found by the producer. It's just important to note that this, this definitely is not representative of what's happening on the landscape during periods of chronic wolf depredation. We, we just didn't see much during this study. Moving on to the yearling group, we only monitored one yearling group on Ranch A in 2021. Again, no wolf or bear depredation to calculate a detection rate based on. It was a great year for that cattle group in the area, in that area. They did have one natural mortality that, that was thought to be high altitude sickness related. We definitely, to better understand detection rates on yearlings, we definitely need more monitoring and in an area with higher conflict history. We've started some discussions and there may be possibilities to try to do this work in the Pine Dale region up in the upper green. That, that's pending further discussion. I threw this map in just to illustrate the effort that's put in by these folks to take care of their daily cattle husbandry duties, but also looking for kills. These tracks, the rider on Ranch C was generous enough to take tracks in 2020. They're color coded by distance. You can see a lot of effort is going in to trying to find and locate these depredations. So those detection rates certainly aren't a product of a lack of effort. So this, is, this plot shows the daily elevation occupied by cattle during the 2020 monitoring season. And I threw this in there to make one point and you can see on ranch B where we had the high natural mortality that much of was attributed to high elevation sickness. They're grazing at a much higher elevation than the other two ranches we monitored on. So a few interesting observations from last summer. The bear pictured here was a chronic depredator. He was responsible for all of the losses that we picked up on Ranch A. So 11 minimum that we know about, but we estimate as much as 26 to 27. And this bear had a train of bears following him that were cleaning up after him. A sow with the cub of the year and a subdolt looking bear. We caught the sow with the cub of the year, relocated her. There was no impact to the depredation that was occurring towards the end of July. We captured this adult male and due to the chronic nature of his conflicts, removed him. And as soon as that happened, the conflict stopped. 
This is really consistent with previous work done in the early 2000s that found that three, three grizzly bears were responsible for 90% of the depredation they picked up on that research. And so just really bodes well for our current management practices in targeted removal of chronic depredators. And the plot at lower left is a plot showing accelerometer data from a GPS transmitter that a calf was wearing. This bear, this bear actually killed the calf. And you can see that on July, 4, July 14th, 1.44 in the morning, that's when the bear killed that calf. There's a flat line in the activity data and then little spikes in activity from the bear moving the carcass around. Just kind of a neat demonstration of what this technology is capable of and how we can kind of put what's going on on the ground, and match it up with what the technology is saying. So in summary, we're making progress modeling environmental factors and their influence on depredation influence with high applicability to our understanding and possibly mitigation of depredation. We successfully monitored over a thousand head of cattle in two years to help us better understand drivers of calf and yearling survival and changes in survival, but also produce producer depredation detection rates. And producer depredation detection rates were highly variable. While depredation is very costly to livestock producers in the context of large cattle groups, it's very difficult to detect. When you think back to the previous slide, when I had all the mortalities tallied up, we had 949 cattle tagged, 3% of those ended up dying from all causes of death. And so we had to have 25 to 30% of the cattle marked to have a substantial representative sample that we could pick up depredation in. And the main point here is that continued monitoring will certainly bolster our multiplier estimates and understanding of depredation rates. I'd like to thank all of our partners with Wyoming again, Fish Department, USGS, US Forest Service, UC Berkeley, Buffalo Bill Center of the West, Wildlife, Service, Wildlife Services, and our project volunteers. They've contributed through all phases of this work. A huge thanks goes out to our partner ranches. They made this project a, a possibility and their, their involvement extended far beyond just letting us tag cattle and be on the property. They were heavily invested in this and really worked well with us to have a blinded study so we could accurately quantify detection rates. So they're great partners. I can't thank them enough. I'd also like to thank Mark Pakla, our project pilot. He made an ambitious effort a reality. And I'd like to acknowledge our project funding sources today, Wyoming and Fish, Buffalo Bill Center, Wyoming Animal Damage Management Board, Greater Yellowstone Courting, Coordinating Committee, Knobloch Family Foundation, National Geographic Society, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. I can now address any questions. Thank you, Clint. That was excellent. Any questions for Clint? Thank you. Uh, President Doobie, Director Nesbitt, members of the commission, thanks for the opportunity to talk and thank you for uh, letting Clint talk about the research that he conducted. Uh, we're very fortunate to have him on as a full-time person. You don't get someone with his field experience and quantitative experience from UC Berkeley too often to come back to our agency. So we're really fortunate to have that. And I'm probably not the last time you'll be seeing him in front of the commission giving you a talk. So I'm here to talk primarily just on we kind of whittled it down to talk about cattle depredation and damage compensation in Wyoming based on previous requests from you as commissioners. A little bit of background, obviously the notion of predators killing livestock is not new. Basically since animals were domesticated, there has been issues of, of depredation. The concept of predator management, predator control pretty much goes back as far as the domestication of livestock. It's pretty interesting if you look at the history of, of North American uh, westward expansion and bounty systems and things. 1630 was the first bounty enacted, as far as we could tell, to control marauding wolves in Massachusetts. 
Uh, in, in Oregon still in the 1930s, they were bounties as much as $50 for a cougar, which is a heck of a lot of money in depression era. So um, it's something that's been around for quite a while, obviously. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of words in this, but I think it's important to go through the history of our damage compensation here in Wyoming. So prior to 1984, uh, chapter 28, which is now the damage regulation, was a regulation titled Restriction of Travel. It was rescinded. And then this is when the current 28 was started. Uh, 84 to 99, all compensation for verified damages only. There was no multiplier. And obviously now we have a multiplier in place. Uh, in 1984, there was a basic requirement for compensation to allow for hunting. And of course, this also governs our uh, damage from, from game species. So, so we have that that occurs a lot more we see with big game species. In 85, uh, the de defined as actual damage. It's very important that we have a definition of damage. Again, there's a lot of scrutiny on the overall damage compensation program. And that's why there's so much verbiage and so much history beyond, be, behind how we got to the point where we're at today. Clint referenced this, uh, this, this research project, Chuck Anderson, who used to work for us, uh, the Black Rock study, as it's called, conducted over uh, north of Jackson, it was one of the first studies to actually evaluate detection rates of depredation. Uh, there, there was an active grazing allotment there that was having issues with grizzly bear depredation. And the, that was back in the old days with VHF data where you tracked everything and they were out at night trying to figure out, in essence, what's being killed versus what was being detected. And so that's where the original derivation of a, comp, a multiplier was 1.67. So this means for every calf verified as lost by the department, by a grizzly bear, we would pay 1.67 times the fall market value of that individual. So again, we're giving the benefit of the doubt that that calf would have made it to the fall. In 2002, the attorney general rescinded the notion of a multiplier as outside the scope of the commission. So therefore the multiplier went away. 2003, the legislator came back, legislature came back, granted the authority to utilize those factors, which brought us back to that 1.67 to one. Again, this is for grizzly bears and calves. Uh, John Oakleaf, who's currently working on Mexican wolves, uh, worked in Idaho on wolves as they were coming back to play and did a lot of seminal work on their interactions with cattle in, in Idaho. And one of the main things they found is they were looking at detection and they found that wolves may kill up to eight times what are found by the herders. And this has played heavily into our current compensation factors. In 2003, the 28 public comment, chapter 28 public comments, we proposed that multiplier of 3.5 to one for calves verified as killed by grizzly bears. In 04, based on public comments and actual loss data, from before grizzly bears. So grizzly bears didn't come into the upper green area until the late 90s. So we had pre and post grizzly bear depredation data. This is where the, it was decided to the new formula of 3.5 to one to calculate compensation for calves damaged by grizzly bears. And this was explained by uh, Mark Racino, the former supervisor of our section and former director, Terry Cleveland in 2004. Uh, 2008 is when uh, Defenders of Wildlife, so it used to be Defenders of Wildlife actually paid for wolf depredation. That got a little too lucrative as wolves continued. And so they backed out of that. That was encum encumbered by the department. And at this point is when the commission adopted the seven to one calculation of compensation for calves and sheep damaged by wolves. Bringing us, I know there was a lot, but it's important to get to that history bringing us to the, the current state of where we're at. And so we've had a couple uh, smaller amendments in 2012 and 2014 due to changes in, in wolf statutes. Uh, but the, the main point here is that this is, as, as you saw Clint's very intensive research, this is research and data-driven way to approach these compensation factors and multipliers used for verified livestock dep depredation because it's heavily scrutinized from multiple viewpoints. Uh, these are our actual, our chapter 28 regulations verbatim. I don't expect you to go through all these, but the main points are, is that we have, I forget, <laughs> we actually have uh, definitions of what damage is. 
Uh, the more likely than not is a very important thing to discuss and that it's written in into those chapter 28 regulations, a common sense approach that basically if, if we feel it was caused by this, this damage was caused by a trophy game species and it's written down, now obviously this one, pretty obvious, that's, that's, that would not be a tough one to tell that a bear did that. Again, this is very important, uh, section three, in that it, the damage to the individual livestock must be confirmed by the department or its representative. And most of all of you have sat through at least one appeal about uh, damage compensation and the notion of open range and terrain and topography. We, de we, we define where an area where a multiplier actually is applicable. And this point in section three is also very important. And I think there's, a, there's people that don't even understand how the, the process works. Uh, producer can't get paid for more than they're missing. And so that's factored into that. And the, these, these multipliers are used, but you, can, you can't, <coughs> if, there's, if somebody's eligible for payment of 23, but they're only missing 12, they can't get paid for 23. So there are multiple checks and balances throughout the system. And so enter Clint Atkinson's research. Again, Clint's very modest, uh, but the, the work that they did up in Cody is, is really groundbreaking. It's something that everybody is very curious about on a global standpoint right now when it comes to conflict and large carnivores. And we were very fortunate, the timing was right to be able to do it here. And so you saw the data that Clint had uh, as far as producer detection. So in order to, to have a, a rigorous multiplier, you have to go out and determine what that producer detection rate is. And so to walk you through an example, and Clint provided this data, but if you just look, so if you take one ranch, we had 368 calves total in the herd, 108 of those are marked. So almost a third of those calves were marked. We had four marked bears or four marked calves killed by grizzly bears, which gives us that grizzly bear depredation rate based on that marked sample. That gives us an, an overall depredation rate that we can take times the total number of calves available to give what potentially should be the number of calves killed. So almost 14 calves based on all that data should have been killed by grizzly bears. We know that the producers detected three out of a total of almost 14 available. Therefore, a compensation to, to make up for that would be 4.5 to one, if that makes sense. And so uh, this is just building on the information that, that Clint provided and that you can see, again, it's very variable annually. Um, again, that, that slide I thought that Clint showed of the, of the cowboy out on the landscape was really striking to show how, how much work goes into this. Uh, the men and women that are out riding herd are working their butts off every day to, to herd their cattle, to find their cattle and to find depredations. And it's not easy, but um, you know, that's why there's this collaborative work. There's a lot of annual localized variability, habitat differences. You know, part of the reason that, that might've had a higher uh, higher compensation factor would have been needed the first years because they were in rougher terrain. Maybe they didn't find them as much. Uh, we do see local, you know, dry years might impact this. Different personnel and experience, both from our perspective and from the producer's perspective, oh, sorry, producer's perspective can impact those. But I, I think that the big thing here is there's a lot of work done in between and, and, and you can see that, that flexibility. And that's what's, what's important is we're looking at things over time that's where our current calf multiplier. And again, we were able to quantify it. There, there's you know, obviously not every natural mortality is being found either. And so Clint alluded to this. Um, there was a monumental amount of work done before anything was marked, before anybody went out in the field because we realized this is a person's livelihood. And in order to accurately look at detection rate, we're gonna have animals get killed that we know about, but the producer's not. So how do you, how do you pass that red face test of knowing something, but, but not producing that to the producer that would bias their results? Well, what happened is Clint did a lot of work beforehand and we all did as a wildlife division talking through meeting with the producers and making the agreement in writing that at the end of the year, we'll give you all the information as to what happened. But during the course of the year, we're going to play it out just like it is normally. So if you find a produce, if you find a, a kill, we're going to do like we normally would from a management action. But if we find a kill, we're going to leave it there. 
for you to, to, to decide or to find. Um, that might not sound like a lot, but there's a lot of trust in that. And that I think was built from the very beginning of this project to make sure that we could work together. And so uh, we've, you've already seen these numbers, quite honestly, the 1.67, the pre and post Upper Green River, Upper Green River Cattlemen Association data, uh, those numbers 3.8 to one are based without a detection rate, but again, very rigorous numbers of off and on that obviously I would never give to the public, but these are the numbers based on our verification, what it would cost from a calf standpoint. And so you see based on four different data sets, we're at right about 3.6 to one from a multiplier. Our current calf multiplier is 3.5 to one. What I like about having these numbers in front of us is being able to have some real world applicability. So uh, again, the Upper Green Cabin were, were fortunate enough, or we were fortunate that they provided this information based on a lot of trust. Uh, I'm not presenting any information as to total numbers, but I'm presenting the information as far as public numbers, as far as what we verified with depredations from grizzly bears and wolves. If you look at their total loss and you actually calculate in our current multipliers of three and a half to one for verified loss of grizzly bears, seven to one for verified loss from wolves, you can see the total line mirrors the verified loss with those multipliers pretty close. And that's what we want to see. And again, this is only what they're eligible for. So on a year like this, they might be eligible for more, but they're only they're, they're not going to get that point. They're going to get that point of total loss, if that makes sense. But it's good to have that real world applicability coming back to a really robust data set. Uh, the yearling, yearling multiplier discussion, uh, obviously that was something that, that there, there was a lot of interest in. Um, currently yearling cattle are not eligible for a damage compensation multiplier. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, I'm not a cattle producer, but, it, but I've been around yearling and cow-calf operations and it's a lot different, obviously. There's a lot more wildness that occurs with yearlings and it's tougher to ride. And there's a lot more um, things that happen with those yearlings on the landscape. Uh, so it's just a whole different behavioral standpoint of those animals. We didn't have much from Clint's study. Uh, again, I know some of the, some of the producers, when, when Clint started the work, it was really focused on looking at wolf depredation. And because of management actions, they really weren't wolves there, but they thought Clint was the Messiah that came in and no wolves killed their cattle. It's great, they wanted him there all the time. But uh, again, you can't make up data. And so again, we didn't have any yearling depredation, but it's, we still had a robust sample. Um, you know, if we were to go for a producer detection rate of natural, natural mortality, it would be 1.84 to 1. But obviously, we're not, we're not quantifying natural mortality. Uh, using some of that same information uh, from the upper green, we can look at cattle stocking rates, our verified depredation, and other loss. And it would take around 2 to 1 ratio to compensate for all losses and realize there's a lot more unknowns in this multiplier. And again, as Clint mentioned, and when we've talked to the cattlemen about the potential for some, some further research opportunities this summer, hopefully in that area, I think it could really add to our knowledge of that. And so again, you've heard me say this before, we're committed to managing and mitigating livestock carnivore conflict and livestock depredation. You know, our, our job is to keep large carnivores on the landscape, but also deal with conflict management. That's vital to the overall story. It's a very multi-layered approach to an ever-changing system. Um, we will always maintain a vigilant conflict resolution in our I&E efforts. And then again, our department stance is to maintain current compensation and multipliers for yearling cattle and continue to research and evaluate yearling loss and producer detection from a damage compensation standpoint. And before I close, I do have to thank Scott Edberg. He didn't know this was coming. Where is there? Um, uh, we've got, this is a Scott, you can't see, but there is that ubiquitous smile on him that was always there. He's helping out pick up a grizzly bear collar in the upper green, actually. And uh, it's going to be weird talking about damage without Scott Edberg net close by. So thank you, Scott. And thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Dan. Any questions for Dan? Any comments? Okay, we do have some blue sheets. Uh, Representative Summers?
So, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Director, thanks for having me. And kind of in this role, I'm Albert Summers, okay. President of the Upper Green River Cattle Association. For the last year, I've, I've been that president of that association for 31 years. But somebody else is going to have to do it. And uh, <clears throat> so I just, just, uh, just for the commission, you know, first of all, I want to thank the Game and Fish for the hard work they've done in our area and in our allotment for many, many years on the issues of large, large carnivores. It is really appreciated. I can guarantee you without the compensation we've received from this department, that we would not be operating in that landscape. It's that simple. It's that simple. And so to understand a little bit about our association, if you don't know anything about us, we graze on we graze on low country in the spring, starting about May. So really we don't have any large carnivore problems down on those BLM lands. And then we go to one where there's multiple BLM allotments. We go to one allotment in the upper green, which is a 130 some thousand acre allotment. It's uh, four pasture systems. We have five rider camps and we keep five riders on the landscape every day, all the time. And if one's gone, we'll get a day rider up there to cover that person for that day. That's how, that's how important it is to monitor these cattle and these large predators. You cannot leave them two days, three days. A calf will disappear overnight. A yearling will disappear in a day. A cow will disappear in three days. I mean, gone, you know, nothing left. And, uh, and so you've got to monitor your cattle. And, you know, when I was, I was asked to kind of present by Dan to give, give our, our data and then to kind of present on yearlings and to kind of look at things. And so what I did is I took our yearling losses. Oh, I, took, I looked at our yearlings between 2010 and 2012, so that three-year period. And then I looked at them from 2013 through 2020. And, uh, and so in those uh, three years, we turned out about, this is association-wide, about 6,606 yearlings. And, uh, and we lost, by to all means, about 127. And so that percentage is about 1.92. And that was, we really started collecting calf data back in 1990, but we didn't collect yearling data because we didn't really think it was going to be an issue. So we didn't start collecting yearling data on our, from our producers or cow loss data until about 2010. And so if you take that kind of divided out, that loss rate for that three-year period is about 1.92% on yearlings. Um, you know, I, I wonder, you know, so what's historical? So my old man always told me, you know, we'd turn out 300 yearlings back, you know, when I was a kid. And he said, you know, if we get, if we only lose five or six during that period of time, we're probably all right. If we got, if we're missing more than six, we better start looking some more. And so that's about 2%. And it's not much different than the calf loss, interestingly enough. So our historic calf loss on that allotment's been around, was around 2% prior to grizzly bears. Our, uh, our loss rates now are up around 10 to 13%, 10% this last year, high of about 13%, 14%. Um, and, and, I got, and I got some of those lost data. And then if you look at the eight years on yearlings from 2013 through 2020, um, during that period of time, that eight-year period, there were 19,956 total yearlings out, a uh, lost total of 529. That's about a 2.65% loss rate. So the loss rate on yearlings in our allotment is increasing, but it's not, you know, it's not increasing terribly, terribly. So it's not like the calf loss rates. And, uh, and so, you know, if, if the way I do the math on a compensation factor, you know, you'd be compensating somewhere between one and a quarter to one and a half percent to capture that on our allotment under our circumstances and the level of riders we have on the allotment. Um, to give you an idea, just in numbers, you know, for this year, um, just just to give you an idea, just straight numbers. So we had two cows killed by bears. We had uh, 50, 50 calves killed by grizzlies. This is confirmed, okay? This is, you, you all confirmed these. We had one calf killed by wolves. 
and we had 18 yearlings verified killed by uh, by bears, grizzly bears. So that gives you an, an idea on, on, on uh, kind of the level. I'll tell you the worst year. The worst year was in 2017. Um, I think we had two cows killed by we had two cows killed by, let me see if I get that right, get the right year. <laughs> yeah, let's see, I gotta get fine calf loss weights for bear, for all. Let's see, I gotta get the right year, 2015. So in 2015, I think there were two cows killed by bears. There were 60, this is confirmed, 66 calves were confirmed kills by grizzlies, seven confirmed by wolf, 11 yearlings killed by grizzlies, and two by wolves. So it gives you an idea of our worst year and then this last year. It's, it, we've been going like this, you know, with, with, with uh, confirmed kills and losses, particularly on calves. We're plateauing out. We have plateaued at different times. We plateaued at about four to five for a while, went to six for a while, and then we had a steady increase to this about 10. And we've been about 10% on those calves um, since, oh, somewhere in 2014. This is total loss, not, not just bear and wolf loss, but total loss. We started hitting around 10%, and, uh, and we still, we're still in that neighborhood, eight, nine, eight, 10, depends on the year. So that gives you an idea where we're at on, you know, I think it is a good time to look at yearling compensation. Um, and certainly, you know, I think some of us will be willing to put some tags on. We're gonna try another little experiment. It probably won't do anything, but um, wildlife services got these little flashy tags that light up at night when something's moved. And I mean, it's a bright light. They're little tags. They got a little solar unit on them. We're going to put that on a bunch of calves and see if there's any effect and uh, to try to find something different. You know, you never know if you never try anything. We've tried different things. Um, the one thing that actually worked the best is we, we shifted a whole rotation. Um, we used to go into a fairly high larkspur area in the middle of the summer. And we'd tip over cattle from Larkspur and then the grizzlies would come in and then we'd get more grizzly kills and then we couldn't keep cattle in there. The Forest Service allowed us to shift that pattern. We started going into that higher unit late, kind of after Larkspur had dried up. We don't track, you know, attract as many grizzlies in there and then uh, we don't have as many losses from depredation either. So we've tried a few things. I've tried the whole bunching thing. It, didn't work. We had as many losses or worse that year, and we did other years. So, um, certainly willing to answer any questions that I can. But I do want to express my gratitude to the department for um, the years of work that you guys have put into us. And the one thing I'm going to say is, you don't have enough people on the ground in the summer. When you know, and I, I've mentioned this yesterday. Um, you can't imagine the amount of pressure that's going to be on this kid next summer in the upper green, you know, if it's like any other year, it's seven days a week. It can be in three or four pastures at a time. When the bears are really hitting, they're hitting. And these, these, these really depredating grizzlies, they'll kill every other night. It's like clock. And, uh, and, and he's got to investigate every hide, every stinking carcass, every maggoted critter that's, that we drag out of the bush you know, and, uh, and so you just need to make sure you take care of that guy and anybody else you have there so he doesn't run dry on us because it's a long summer. <laughs> Thank you. And I'd be sure. Thank you, uh, Representative Summers. Um, I have one question. I noticed that Dan had, had mentioned it too. What was it in the 90s that uh, kind of a 90s benchmark that we've seen more of an escalation of, of grizzly bears? Was there a, is that, was it the cutoff? Was it nineties? They just started getting more proficient or prolific or what was, you had well, mentioned it too. Specific to the upper green, they weren't there yet. Yeah, and, then, and that's when 
grizzly bears naturally expanded. And I think personally, what really changed is when at first it was primarily males. Once the females got there and was a breeding population, that's when I think things really wrapped up. Would you agree, Robert? So what had kept them expanding prior to the 90s? Do we, do we have any idea? Just, Just slow. I mean, the, they were down to a really low number. It took them that long to naturally expand through the landscape. There's nothing stopping them. It was just natural expansion. Once they got there, I mean, there's a reason that 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 that's some of the best habitat in Wyoming. I mean, it's great for moose. It's great for elk. It's great for cattle. It's great for grizzly bears. It's great for everything. And so, um, once bears got there, they found the land of milk and honey. Quite honestly, because I was wondering what had changed, you know, because there was out of cows on the Black Rock, so they came on over there. <laughs> <laughs> there are people. <laughs> Once that was retired. <laughs> and, you know, and, and people give old Terry Schramm a hard time. But, uh, you know, this one I do believe. And that is those big fires in Yellowstone in the 80s there. I think they shifted some bears around. And, and some of that might have been that. But this is just a natural progression of a bear. Our first, you know, we were, we were pushing into Fish Creek in 1993 and one of somebody that was gathering it was we we bring in like 20 riders to gather the face of this hill and uh one rider found this injured calf didn't know what it was and uh and so we he dropped it and then when on our way back we stopped and well the calf had died and uh we got off and we got to looking around it and the oldest cowboy in the bunch he looked down at, at it and he says that's a bear kill and it was right over the weathers and we just laughed and went on and three years later we weren't laughing thank you thank you thank you representative summers uh jim mcgagna thank you mr chairman jim mcgagna with the wyoming stock growers association this is an issue that we always remain heavily involved in uh, the specific issue that I'll address with regards to the yearling compensation factor actually came to our attention during the 2021 legislative session when a bill was introduced that would have had the legislature mandate a compensation formula. We stepped up quickly to stop that from going forward because we felt that you as a commission have the authority to set those and that's where that authority properly rests. Uh, since that time, we've attempted to reach out to uh, cattle producers in the grizzly areas uh, in the northern end of the Bighorn Basin, as well as, as with Mr. Summers and the Upper Green to, to kind of get a sense of what was going on. And, and it's our feeling as we've listened to these people and the records that they've kept in different places that yes, there's a factor, it's not a large one, but we believe there is a justification for somewhere as was pointed out between that 1.2 and perhaps a 1.5. Uh, <coughs> And that ought to be recognized, particularly as we have more and more people running yearlings today than we typically did uh, 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, in terms of where you are today, and we appreciate the research that's been done, <coughs> we understand that you want any decision to be based on good information. <laughs> uh, I would tell you that our preference or our recommendation to you today would be rather than tell these producers, you have to wait another year before you might get uh, some recognition of that factor would be to initiate something at this time on the lower end of that, perhaps a 1.2, then continue the studies and initiate the studies in the upper green and adjust that number uh, up or down as further studies, further analysis might, might justify. We'd, we'd prefer that to saying, let's wait for another year. But in, in either case, we do think that there will be a justification for going forward with, with a small adjustment factor on yearlings with that. Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions for Mr. McGagney? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions from the audience regarding this topic? So Commissioner Doobie, Commissioner Director Dick, so the, the option before you, or as Mr. McGagney said, you can, you can direct the department to move forward with looking at including some type of yearling multiplier in the uh, chapter 28 regulation or you could have the option of directing the department to work work with some other producers on some additional research to come up with a more so, a solid number. 
or you can direct the department to remain status quo at this time or a combination of a couple of those and stuff. So um, that's kind of where, yeah. where we're at. Any suggestions or comments? We, as I stated previously, we are, you know, looking at some changes to chapter 28. Um, I don't want to say too much uh, because you'll be getting some um, information tomorrow in executive session on some legal matters that have been uh, presented before the RAG rep that uh, we need to discuss, and, but uh, we'll, we'll do that tomorrow. I guess, it, go ahead, Mr. Broca. Mr. President, um, process question. I'm comfortable making a motion to put a yearling compensator ratio forward. But now with what Mr. Edberg just said, how would, that go, how would that go into effect? When would that go into effect for our chapter 28? So we would, you know, we would initiate that uh, change in chapter eight. We would take that through the APA process like we do any other regulation. Um, you know, we've got some other changes we may possibly bring forth. Um, and so, you know, it depends on when we get that uh, draft finalized, uh, get it out for internal review, the traditional 45 days of public review, and then uh, back to the commission. Could we have that done by um, July? Or September at the latest, we could have it in place um, for uh, the, the end of the, of the 2022 grazing season, an issue that I have to think of, or I guess Dan Smith will have to think of in, in, the, in the director and, and uh, uh, division chief will be, and probably a legal question is, do any yearlings that are, are injured or, or damaged by um, trophy game prior to that raid come into effect, come into the multiplier? And I would say probably they would fall under the previous regulation and anything confirmed and verified after that reg becomes in effect would have that new multiplier. So we could have, you know, uh, a one-to-one -one and then a part of the year and a 1.2, the other part of the year, whatever you, you decide to go with. So long story short, we take it through the APA process like we do every other reg and we could probably get that going in the next month or so. Um, as you know, this is a very complex reg. we got to really make sure everything's covered and stuff just because of, of the damage issues. And we want to make sure we do it right instead of fast. But we are committed, they are committed of doing it the right way. <laughs> have we, Mr. Roberts, have we got, uh, we've got, have we got the description of it? I mean, I noticed before we had talked about what the actual description of it was going to be. Do we have that? Is that, do we have that definitive? Description of yearling. Yes. Talking about. You know, that are things that we, we don't have an official definition. We, those are the things that are in our, in our radar that we are working on along with definition of a calf. Um, one thing about the reg, we don't want to define a term that is not used in the reg, but we'll have that discussion. But if you go forward with a, a multiplier for yearlings, we will have a clear definition of yearling as well as other, some other livestock classes. At least that's our plan to move forward. Commissioner Lundball. Did I hear you correctly that we're getting be getting some additional information tomorrow that might affect this, or did I mishear that? I think during the executive session, you'll be getting some uh, updates on some legal matters that the, the AG just dealt with um, regarding some damage claims. Okay, thank you. You know, the other thing I'd say, and we we could find the answer to this, is, is that if, let's say the reg wasn't, if you directed the department to move forward with changing that, the, the, uh, the multiplier on yearlings and it didn't go into effect, didn't get approved until the September commission meeting. Um, I think there's at least, and we can ask, have Jenny look into this, a way for the commission when they approve the regulation to make it um, retroactive because it's a commission regulation, not a state statute. I think statutes constitutionally can't be retroactive. But a regulation could be different. So I'd just throw that out to you. And then we have to, you know, go with the governor's approval in that time frame before it's officially active. So there's some questions we'd have to answer on Director Nesvik's question. So we have the option of doing nothing and leaving it the way it is. So we have the option of, of directing the department to go back to the drawing board and come up with a number or we can pick a number ourselves. So I believe that's the option we have sitting on the table. I would entertain a motion if somebody would like to. Mr. Dubin, or, real quick, I just want to clarify, we, the sure. department's coming up with a number. Would that include us working with, uh, with some cattle producers and trying to do some additional research to come up with a more solid number? 
Could. Or it could be the commission just says we want it to be. Sure. X. Mr. President. I'm wondering if we should wait till we hear the information that's been talked about tomorrow morning before we make any decisions. We could bring this up tomorrow. I believe we could. Is that record or Deputy Kennedy? Yeah, you can definitely do that. Um, do you believe, is it your judgment that that could bear on this issue? Of I'm going to let our attorney speak on that. <laughs> Um, commission, as far as coming up with a uh, new value to put on your multiplier, that issue within itself is probably not something um, that any of the current litigation um, would impact as far as in your decision making. Uh, that wasn't a so um, if you today wanted to make a decision on the value of the multiplier, based on the science that's been presented to you and the arguments you've heard from constituents, um, anything that has happened as far as litigation and the issues in that, um, uh, you have had cases where uh, folks really have argued for a change in the multiplier. Um, but as far as what may be decided, the value of the multiplier is up to you. If, if that is helpful in any way. Clear as mud? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Thank you, amazing. sorry, I wasn't mean. No, no, that's completely fair. <clears throat> um, it is. But as far as the issues that were litigated and why um, those, uh, that some of them, some of it was based on wanting a multiplier like to apply to caps. Um, the, some of it was, um, yeah, basically uh, whether or not the decision-making of a arbitration board, uh, you know, what applies to their decision-making process. That was a topic of another of your cases. So um, as far as, like I said, uh, the value of the multiplier, it's really up to your discretion and based on what the constituents are, you know, their comments as well as the science before you. Thank you. Any more questions for Commissioner Roberts? You look like you want a question. No, no, that's, I'll figure it out. Commissioner Broca. Mr. President, I'm ready to go. I would move that the commission increase the yearling payment, damage payment to a 1.25 to one ratio. And that the department continued to do this research on the, that that's been presented today until we, we confirm what that ratio really is. But considering all the testimony we've had in the last year on the issue, the yearling guys need some help and then it's our responsibility to help. So my motion is to make that a 1.25 to one ratio. For a second. I'll second. It's moved by Commissioner Brokaw and second by Commissioner Bird to raise our uh, multiplier for yearlings, actually in, put into a multiplier of 1.25 to one. Any discussion? Yeah. Uh, monetarily, Robert. what, uh, how will that impact this monetarily? Do you know? Mr. Edberg looks like he's pretty handy with that. <laughs> So I don't have the exact math, but here's some, here's some numbers. Um, FY16, we verified 24 yearlings as being damaged by trophy game. 17, 24, 18, 27, 19, 37, and 20 is 45. So um, that's some math. And I, and I think I do have some uh, actual numbers here, but I think we went with a higher multiplier um, Let's see here. Of course, if we do raise this, we're more than we may very well receive more damage claims on yearlings. And it's possible. Yeah, if we use the existing multiplier, which is off the table, it'd be a 
you know, a significant, significant increase. So this, this 1.25 um, isn't gonna be too, too much more for payments. It's like Brian was doing some math. Just took a thousand bucks. I think I'm just throwing it as, as an example. I think Mr. Reyes gave us Mr. Reyes one. Did you give us a number yesterday on what you got for yearlings? I, I, did you give us a number? Or was it the fellow in the back? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, re I remember one of you two saying something about that yesterday. So. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, yearlings to your price paid uh, 1434 they got per head. Depends on the year. Mr. President, I have another question. I'm late well, with this question. Twenty thousand dollars. With a high number of thirty, I use thirty year lengths. That's an average. That's a good average. Yeah. Question broke off. Scott, on as I recall, yearlings was one of the hardest age classes to confirm to find. So we're paying on thirty head a year. How many yearlings are reported missing compared to what are confirmed killed? I didn't catch that in Clint's presentation. Clint, do you want to, do you have that on your on your presentation? I don't. I don't. It's I, a, actually, calves are harder to find. Are they typically yearlings? Based on what represent Mr. Summers, he's not representative today. Um, based on what Mr. Summers said, you know, that's probably somewhere. Uh, there's probably about for every four yearlings that are lost, there's probably about one to one and a half that are not found. Am I right? And on our damage claim affidavit, you just have to report sheep and calves missing mm -hmm. due to trophy game animals, and we don't break out yearlings in that in that damage claim affidavit, so we don't really have a good way of tracking tracking that on most that's claims. what i remember was difficult to track yeah the form yeah thank you so if i may just real on quick on the motion I, I just want to make sure that we're clear is that the actual motion would actually mean that you're directing department to include a 1.2 multiplier into a draft regulation that will be taken out for for through the apa process because we really don't have the authority to include that in the regulation right now without running through that apa process is that correct and 1.25 1.25 Yes, that would be correct. That's the intent of my motion, yes, Ms. President. Okay, thank you. Any more discussion? Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Okay. Aaron, did you get the opposed? I oppose it. All right. Thank you. We will get working on this regulation and uh, with all our other changes that we think can be uh, applicable and get it in the process. And thank you. Thank you. All right, let's take a quick five minutes, please. Mr. Brimar. Good afternoon, Mr. President, Director Nesvik, and members of the commission. Thanks for the opportunity to um, give a little overview on our, some of our elk management issues. And what I'd like to do is just take a few minutes to give you a little bit of a, a summary of some of the management challenges um, an introduction to this topic, and then we'll, we'll hear from some of the folks that um, have come to uh, the meeting today. Um, elk populations in Wyoming are really very special, and talking to non-residents, you know, it doesn't take very long to understand that they hold Wyoming in a really high regard in terms of um, hunter success and the hunting experience that they have when they come to Wyoming. Um, our applications um, continue to trend up, Although we're a little bit, um, most of our hunters wait until the last couple of days, much to uh, Jennifer's dismay to apply. Um, we're, we're seeing a little uptick in numbers of licensed uh, applicants. Last year, we had uh, 25,000 non-residents apply for a full price elk license. That was 25% of increase. We also saw an increase in the cow um, license applicants um, in the non-resident draw. Residents were pretty stable, but we saw um, close to 43,000 apply for a full price license last year and 16,000 apply for a cow calf license. 
um, these unique qualities of Wyoming's um, elk management come with a, that come with a robust elk population also come with a lot of challenges. And um, the landowners that are here today will kind of voice some of their concerns regarding those challenges that we're facing. Um, in Wyoming, we have 35 elk herds, 15 of those are at objective and 12 of them are above objective. So about 30% of our elk populations are over objective. When I canvassed our regions about some of the reasons that they had for not being able to achieve objective, access is one of those common themes that they voiced uh, concerns with and, and have challenges achieving that, um, that, that goal, that population goal that we have set. Um, our personnel work closely with landowners across the state and re we really truly appreciate the access that is provided for um, our hunting publics. Um, elk are quite a sensitive animal. Um, they move off when there's hunting pressure as most of these landowners will probably attest. Um, sometimes you have about three years before they really get sensitive to the changes in management, but ultimately they move off and they're, they will move from one property to the next and find refuge where they can, they can kind of stay away from um, where the hunters have more opportunity. The other thing that a lot of landowners are, are, get frustrated with is they reach a saturation point with uh, hunters calling and the numbers of hunters that are on their places. So again, those hunting seasons may work for a few years, but those animals often move off. And elk really do learn. Um, they're also able to take advantage of the habitats that are available to them. They're a generalist, so they can they're, they're really good at seeking out opportunities that, where they can uh, survive. They have, um, their calves also have a high survival. And especially if you're in Eastern Wyoming, um, the survival on calves is pretty high. If you get close to Yellowstone, you'll, you'll see our hunting season changes are really tiered towards those migratory animals. So we don't put too much pressure on those migratory animals. When you get to this part of the state, high calf numbers relate to high reproduction in subsequent years. And so we really need to um, take advantage of that when we can to, to, to get a harvest on those populations. It's also very evident that those large numbers of elk impact other grazing species on, on the range. And we're pretty sensitive to that as well. And I'm referring to mule deer as, as most of you know. So our wildlife managers work closely with landowners, outfitters and sportsmen and they explore opportunities for hunter management areas. We've got 44 of those across the state. We also experiment with um, hunter management and access programs, the HMAP programs. And those are more of a handshake deal with a landowner that will put somebody in the area to take hunters out <laughs> and specifically target elk if they'll provide access. And we, we currently have one going on in the Black Hills right now with 10 landowners. And in those areas, we reduce the, the damage potential that those landowners experience by basically removing elk as they come in to cause damage. Um, historically, we've had another one in Southeast Wyoming here in 2012. We had um, a number of landowners that uh, allowed us to access 250,000 acres. And that year that we did that, our harvest went from 700 elk to 1,200 elk in just that one year period. And so it basically worked really well, but it, it doesn't work long-term because again, elk start to figure things out. And unless you have a really large area, those animals will shift to a, a refuge area and then stay over there um, on the place where they have more security. So our, our game fish managers continue to spend an incredible amount of time with landowners for access and damage. And preliminary information from last year indicates that we had the 41 damage claims for elk and it was $358,000 for those damage claims. And that's a pretty good indicator that we just have too many elk in some places in Wyoming, and there's problems with that. Um, this particularly is true in uh, Sheridan, Casper, and the Laramie regions. Um, you also may be aware that we have challenges on our, some of our interstate herds. I don't know if, Ms. if Commissioner Roberts has heard from Utah, but when Utah elk come into the Cokeville area, we have some late elk seasons and, and we'll hear from some of their managers that they would like us to cut back on harvesting their elk because they come in, once they come over, they cause us damage. We see real conservative seasons once we get over the state line in the Black Hills and along our border with Colorado. Those states all have conservative seasons right on the state line and then that also contributes to our, our, um, our issues. As we approach the season setting time of the year, as you know, we're, we're approaching that now, 
our managers will be reaching out to landowners, sportsmen to find ways to formulate our hunting season proposals. We are uh, cognizant of the high elk populations that they compete with other species like deer. They also compete with landowners trying to make a living with livestock. We'll consider, we consider the landowner concerns and we understand the public's passion for wildlife because we really hear from a lot of our constituents that they love to see a high quality elk herd, but we've got to strive to find a balance with that. And so our goal in the future is going to be to continue to work with, with our stakeholders and again, find that balance for um, access and for uh, license availability so that we don't have that saturation. We're continue to have saturation with a lot of these landowners, but we just need to find more area where those people can hunt elk. And with that, I'll just uh, end it there. And if there's other yeah. folks here to speak. Uh, of those uh, 12 areas that are over objective, are they primarily in Eastern and Northeastern Wyoming? Yeah, it's pretty consistent that once you get East of the Continental Divide, you have just a lot of those um, private land areas where some landowners love them and they want to have more elk. And then the next landowner is trying to make a traditional way of life and, and elk are kind of a, quite a problem. So that's true. Any questions right now? Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, the blue sheets, Mr. Reyes. Director, commissioners, thank you for having me. I'm glad the elk are doing well in the state of Wyoming, in my account and the grass that we're losing. But uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and make this short. I'm a rancher. I ranch in southeastern Wyoming. I ranch in five different ranches in southeastern Wyoming: Hannah, McFadden, Kai Siding, Albany 12, and Wheatland. And we're having a terrible problem with the overpopulation of the elk. I believe your elk model that you have created is a complete wreck and disaster the way they're overpopulating on our range. Licensing. It's not gonna, at this point, it's gonna cut enough of the elk herd down <clears throat> to make it where we can live with them. I think the overpopulation is staggering right now. I'm gonna, the points that I'll make to this commission, first of all, we're seeing a decline on our mule deer in our area. I believe some of it might be W. CWD, a lot of it, I think, is just pressure, same habitat, confirms the same habitat as the elk are. Uh, so with that in mind, I, I used to hear from this commission about riparian areas, sensitive areas, managed health management of the range. I, now we have I don't know what we have. I hope you know, but I'm going to estimate four or five thousand head of elk in area six, and those elk are just racing heck with the riparian areas, uh, streams, brush where the deer survive. Those. Uh, those areas are critical. Uh, the creeks, uh, I tell you, the other, it wasn't long. The other day, I showed up to one ranch. I'll give you one example. And there was somewhere between 150 to 250 elk. They took, they took off the minute they saw me down the creek. We have big 14 foot bright green gates now, we leave them open for them to travel through. So of course I stop and I'm watching this 150 to 250 and they're headed right for that gate. And I'm going, man, this is gonna work. They're gonna get through here. Well, I'll be damned if a jackrabbit didn't jump out of the, out of the willows and that lead cow took a left, a hard left 
and 50 yards away, there was a fence there. And they just took that fence for about a quarter of a mile. The first few, I thought, man, we got it made. I'm going to have a couple of broken wires, not a problem. And then he got to the last 10, and somebody decided to stick their head between a couple of staples, a couple of wires, and walk. You, you know this. Uh, and walk through with a quarter mile of fence. This, this fencing is uh, this costing us a lot of money. Uh, running the elk are costing us a lot of money. I'm going to give you that. I think the rest of the group will cover a lot of what I was going to say. So, but I will, I, I do want to give you an example, and you can simple math. Let's base this on a 400 cow ranch that also runs 300 head of elk in the same range. Elk is six tenths of an animal unit. A yearling steer or heifer is six tenths of an animal unit. So very simple math. The research I did talking to brand inspectors and guys on the Laramie Plains, 20 to $25 to run a yearling for a month. 20 times 12 is 240 bucks. Times 300 elk, that's 72,000. Are you doing the math for me? <laughs> <laughs> you, you do it, uh, that's $72,000 on a 400 cow ranch. Now I'm gonna give you another scenario. Same 400 and 300 elk ranch. On Albany 12, we used to leave enough feed in the meadows that we could get in there the middle of April. If we do that now with the number of elk we have, we don't have any, we don't have any feed. You've seen that at the Ringsby, and we see it all over. Uh, so that's costing me 30 days of feeding hay in the spring. In the fall, I used to come out of there Thanksgiving, sometime in late November. I'm having to get out of there now in October. Same deal, another 30 days. Uh, feeding because our crops are not out in the wheatland flats where we can turn the cow. <laughs> so they, and there's no grass to be leased around there. Therefore, we go ahead and haul hay up there. Let's put hay at $220 a ton. That's 11 cents a pound. Feed that cow 30 pounds a day for 60 days. That's three. $3.30 a day for 60 days is $198 that I'm losing. That comes to $79,000. Is that right? Oh, thank you. Uh, this, is, this is where I have the problem. This is another scenario. Same cow. Same 400 cow, 300 elk. If I run six tenths, if there are six tenths of an animal unit, that is cutting me out of 180 cows I can run on that ranch. At 85% of the calf, so, and these are very conservative numbers. Let's say I actually just take 85% of those 180 calves to market. <coughs> to, to me, this is where the problem starts with me. If I cut myself 180 cows or 153 calves, Divide that by two, that's 76 bull calves, that's 76 heifer calves, six point something. Uh, so, so 
I'll take those 76 cab, half of them are gonna be pound out, go to market. Hopefully 50% will make it to my bull sale. In my bull sale, I like to think they'll bring, I'm sure Walt will pay $4,500 for them. <laughs> this is very conservative number, okay. Now we're talking 171,000 that I'm losing on that ranch. This is the problem. It's not so much about the money. It's you're depriving me the opportunity of profitability. And I just showed you how it works. By eating that grass, by the elk eating that grass, I have no recourse with that ranch. The only thing I can really do, I can call Dave Berry and split it up in a hundred acre piece or 80 and who live happily ever after. That is not what we want to do. We are ranchers. We don't want to be outfitters. We don't want to guide. We are ranchers. That's what we love to do. That's what my kids love to do. And that's what I love to continue doing. So that's one option. The other option is what I did at the Thai Siding Ranch, I contracted with a wind energy. And I'm not a wind guy, but the difference between a fourth generation rancher and a first generation rancher, which I am, all that means is I got payments to make. The rest of those guys are paid up. So these numbers are pretty real to me and, and pretty important. So those are, that, that's where, the key for me is the opportunity of profitability that I'm being cut out of. That's, that's the problem that I'm having. When you eat, when the elk eat my grass, I have nothing else to sell. So that's, that's a big problem. Here are six ways to alleviate the hurt. And we've gone through this for 30 years now. Extra tax to for landowners. Figure how you want it. But there'll be other ideas here, not just giving tags out. I think Donald have some, Walmart have some, I don't know. Compensate for fixing fence at today's prices. It's costing us $1,400 a mile to build a mile of fence up there in the rock. I just told you, I watched them take a quarter of a mile out. I've never asked for anything from the game and fish. Compensant ration for grazing, the same as we just talked about. It's very simple. $20 a month for 12 months. I think we need to, one of the things I would like to look into is to amend or change the damage grazing statue that we have where we can get compensated in the Wheatland Flats if elk trample the corn or the alfalfa. I've never asked for anything, but I'm we can. I'm a grass farmer. That grass is, I, I just proved to you by that hundred and some thousand dollar, hundred and seventy one thousand dollars, that grass is just as important to me as that corn crop. So I think ranchers ought to be compensated and they ought to be put whatever that statue is. is. You're going to touch on that, Mr. Magagna, are you? Thank you. Uh, so those are extra tax compensate fencing. Equal as year lunch, uh, change them in. Ray Garson had an idea this morning, and I think it's commendable. Let's start a pilot program of some kind. You have the sciences, you have the data, you have the little green pickups running around. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and start a pilot program that gets something done. We're about to the end of the rope here. This, this, is, this is probably the worst thing that's happened to me in the ranching community since I've been ranching, which has been since 1977. 
it, it is devastating. Uh, next, let me see what I got. I get, I'm running out of, I'm running out of room here. Uh, I tell you, and I might as well address this while I'm up here because it's come up every time we talk to the game and fish and thus access, access, access. To me, I let responsible hunters hunt on my property. I do not and I will not throw the gates wide open to every person that wants to hunt on my property. Now, and I'm pretty well known in the state of Wyoming. I think if they held the election opening day of elk season, I bet you I would beat Mark Gordon on this deal because I, I get calls all over. So, uh, and we all do, you know, so, so let's, uh, I, I think we just need to be compensated we need to cut the numbers down, and I'm not a welfare kind of guy. When we get those numbers when we need to be, you can take your compensation away. I don't have a problem with that. I just assume make it running cash. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Any questions for Mr. Reyes while he's up there? Okay, thank you. Mr. McGagna? We definitely do. <laughs> Mr. Christensen. Chairman, Mr. Director Nesvik, commissioners and staff. I'm Walt Christensen from Newcastle and I'm a fourth generation rancher. And uh, Juan may think that I don't have bills to pay, but he's wrong there. And I hope I can buy bulls at his sale for $4,500. And that hasn't happened for quite some time. But I tell you what, we need some help from you folks. And we've had the same model for years and years. And you got to be careful what you wish for. About 40 some years ago, I told my wife, I said, it'd be nice to have a little resident herd of elk. Well, let me tell you, we've got a little more than that. And then you guys have got a, a, a decision to make. And, and uh, I, I don't envy the position you guys are in. And you've got a problem with our neighboring state of South Dakota. Th those guys over there, they issue elk tags you know you got to apply for them well if you get an elk tag in south dakota then you can't even apply for another one for nine years so it's not very far from spearfish and there's and deadwood and there's a whole slew of those people and they come over and then they they're glad to pay the 700 bucks or whatever it is for the the tag to come and hunt and you'd be surprised at how many friends we get that time of year. And, and I like to hunt, my kids like to hunt. And we let 20, 25 hunters come in there. Last fall, we killed 14 cows and three bulls. And, and we had to guide the people and we didn't make any money. We, didn't, we don't charge anything. <clears throat> if they could kill half a dozen of them, it'd suit me. We could take care of our elk problem in our area if there wasn't a jail sentence waiting for us. My son and I could take care of the problem. Well, I sure as heck don't want to go to jail for a damn elk. And the, the coupon that you put on the license, 16 bucks for a dead elk that isn't hurting us anymore. And, and we haven't, we haven't uh, redeemed those those permits for, I can't tell you how many years because it's a slap in the face. You get 16 bucks for a coupon for an antelope, a deer and an elk. And I realize you guys don't have an unlimited amount of money, but we as landowners and ranchers 
we'd like to be in business. You know, like I said, I've, I'm a fourth generation rancher and I'd like to be in business and my kids would too for an, another few generations. Several years ago, we had this young gentleman in Newcastle and then he fled to Jackson. I don't know where he's at now, but, but anyway, I think I expressed my, my concern to him a long time ago and we're just, we need to do something different. And like Juan said, if you had some pilot program, I realized, you know, Wyoming's a big state and it's a whole different world on the west side of the state versus the east side because we're mostly private land on the east side of the, the Rockies and it's different on the west side. So it, it's, uh, I, I don't know how you guys are going to come up with an equitable deal, but a pilot program, if you have something that you don't have to stick your feet in the sand and that's the way it is every year from this point on, and I understand you don't want to do that because there's, and we've got other problems with neighboring landowners. They love the elk and they don't let any hunters in. And so that's, that's the way you guys, I mean, that's the way the system is set up to cut the numbers down is kill a few of them. Well, we've got migratory elk and most of them go to the Jasper fire area over around Jewel Cave in South Dakota. That's where most of them are at right now. And there's not much snow in the Black Hills. And, and so they've got unlimited feed source over there and they don't graze that area very much. It's a national forest. So our elk on our ranch, I think this is a conservative figure. We probably have around 300 in the summertime. I wouldn't care if they were there now, but the fence that they tear up, and uh, I talked to one of our game wardens in Sundance there. I said, can you buy some seed, some oats or some grass seed, or how about a roll of barbed wire? Well, hell, he wouldn't, <laughs> he said, we don't have anything in, in place. We can't do that. And, uh, and then, you know, we used to go around the fence once in the spring. Now you got to go around the dang fence about once a week and we don't we don't have the manpower to do that and i don't know whether you guys have got any young young ambitious people like doug used to be <laughs> come and fix fence but we we don't feel like it's fair to the landowner to to have to to bear the the, the brunt of this whole whole dang thing i mean it's it's getting worse and worse every year. And our elk, uh, there's probably two to 300 of them, like I said, and they go two different ways. On the north end of our range, they, they cross the highway and they go west of Indian Cara Mountain is where they winter. And then, the, like I said, the others go to the Jasper Fire area. And in South Dakota, they don't think they've got enough elk. I wish what, what somebody would do is build a big tall fence on the state line after the elk get over there and then, then put it back up. And you guys are a, a government entity. If you could uh, go to Mr. Biden and go to Afghanistan and retrieve some of those helicopters that he left over there, then you could bring those helicopters over here and you could herd those elk into a, into a, a trap somewhere and then take them somewhere where people think they want the damn things. And if you could get them trapped, and I've got a truck and I'd be more than happy to load them up and I'll bring them to Cheyenne and unload them right in front of Frontier Park over here, but it's, it's getting frustrating. And the, the one thing that I don't want to do, and I don't think anybody does, is get into a courtroom and fight over the dang thing. But it's, uh, it, it's, it's getting 
beyond repair. So anyway, I appreciate you guys' time. And this is one, one place that I wanted to get for a long time to talk to the head of the outfit. And anyway, I appreciate it. And Doug, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions for Mr. Christensen? Mr. Garson? Chairman, commissioners, uh, I also ranch the Iron Mountain area, uh, 45 or 50 miles northwest of here. Uh, my my uh, message this afternoon is about the uh, next generation of ranchers. Uh, there's four of us ranchers that live in that area and right now uh, we have families that have uh, they, they're interested in continuing the ranching operation and uh, carrying on and being the operators uh, I've uh, kind of passed that stage and that's what makes me bring this subject up is my sons are, are trying to finance this uh, operation. And, and I guess uh, us older operators have uh, reduced our calendars to take care of, compensate for what the elk are eating. And in so doing, we've uh, reduced our expenses that we would usually put on for ranch improvements, equipment, labor, and, and what have you. And so uh, I, uh, I, I, I uh, feel for him because my son, he's starting in the hole and, and uh, I don't know if it, without some miracle worker he's going to be there a long time uh, I did uh, prepare a, a letter for you but I had a, a little idea that I talked about uh, these elk in our area they're year round residents and they've established orders <coughs> that they like to use and uh, uh, I, the idea I have is uh, in these corridors set up a, an elk feeding station where uh, we could exclude the antlered elk and then have uh, cameras there that would identify the cows. And then uh, if a cow elk sticks her head in there to get a ration of sweet feed she uh, will also get a mark on her head that uh, identifies her in that particular station will uh, feed her again. Uh, and I think uh, this, this can't be rocket science. Uh, there's, I think uh, we already have uh, drugs that work on bovine cows and I think with a little work uh, and experimenting that they can be made to work on elk also. This is kind of a long range approach to reducing the numbers, but uh, we need to start somewhere. Uh, I have a Little, my game camera. I'll, I'll show you. Uh, this is a, we can we can pass along here if you want to hand it to us. Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. Would you like? Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Garfield? Mr. Willis? Thank you uh, for the time to speak for a minute. I'll try and be quick. Um, just all the horror stories the guys have already talked about. I can bump on again. I don't need to. My name is Don Willis. Uh, we're on the north end, uh, area six here between Iron Mountain and Seville Canyon. Uh, we've been there 31 years. Uh, we always had a hunting program to go with our cow-calf operation. Uh, we're real pro-wildlife. Uh, we try and run the ranch and manage it to help the wildlife. Um, what we're seeing is just 1990, there were 35 elk there. And it's not unusual now to see 1,200 elk on our winter and spring pasture. We keep cows up there pretty high elevation, work hard to pile up the hay. Um, all the hay from day one, 1990, uh, went into elk tight haystacks because we did not want to uh, fight that fight with elk in the haystacks. So we just put that to bed 30 years ago. Um, we work, we tried to work, uh, with our game and fish people, our, our biologist, Martin Hicks, uh, game warden, Kelly Todd. We have good relationship. We have new game warden, Kristen now, um, trying to all work together. Uh, but this, we've about reached a, uh, tipping point. It's just, uh, we're, we're about a 400 cow ranch and we're running 300 cows and um, the rest of it, the elk are just scooping it up. It's just crazy. And I can do the figures like Juan, Charlie will follow me and have more figures, you know, but there's $70,000 worth of grass damage that we donate to the, to the elk deal every year, according to our figures. Um, and I realize that area six thing, and it's again, I'm repeating, but you know, it's such a high percentage of private property. There's no 14,000 footers behind us for these elk to go seven months a year. Or so we're a year round deal with them. They do and they come and they go, um, but mostly come. If you're taking the better, the better care you take care of your ranch, the, the worse the elk damage is. Um, they've completely taken away our ability to do range management, uh, save grass, stockpile grass. Uh, we still, we've always done rotations and that helps. They really like to move in behind the cows on any regrowth. Uh, we're just being blown up for range management by these free roaming elk when you get into those kind of numbers. Um, we have to uh, change our times that we hay. We end up 
we end up trying to beat the elk to the hay crop, uh, upper meadows, higher elevation that normally you would you would let grow later on into August. Uh, if you don't go get them, you'd lose them. Uh, we've never put in for any fence damage claims. Our fencing has doubled, maybe tripled by now on the time and equipment it's taken to go around our 76 miles of fence every year. Huge expense. And like the guys have already said, it's not once a year. You do it, you're back out there. You're trying to hay, you've got tore down fence, you've got all this collateral damage of bulls not being with the cows during the breeding season. You know, it's, it's getting to be a big deal. Um, let's see, we've never asked for any claims. Uh, the game and fish is, they've, they're doing what they can within what their model is. Uh, there's still leftover cow tags uh, available. So it's not a lack of licenses. Um, and they've got that season from the mid August to the first of February to allow for wherever these elk are to continue. You know, I mean, it's a, I mean, they're working with us, but it's the, it's not working is I guess the main point I have to say. Uh, I think that somehow there may have to be compensation for this grass where we have that big in numbers of elk. Um, I'm with Juan and Ray. I mean, we just as soon run our cows and not deal with the elks, but the elks are there. We like the elks, we like the deer. And as you've already heard, the elk are pushing the mule deer thing away. Um, and then I guess just the one point I would like to make to you is that we've tried at our place to, I'm a first generation. I have the mortgage payment every year. We do what we need to do to make the ranch payment. And we've tried, we've tried to do whatever we can to generate our income, keep it with a good ranch and take good care of the of the wildlife, but we just, I guess we're asking the board and the commission to, it may have to think outside the box, but there's too many elk. There's just, and we, we've been through the hunter management. We've let people in. We used to be on the call list for this office, used to sell the licenses and give them our phone number. You know, we've tried to get the public in there. We try, we do it with outfitters. Now the most effective seem to be the local outfitters, the young guys that have the equipment and the wherewithal to go into that rough windblown country and actually get those elk killed. Uh, but the, it's not enough numbers. So I guess just throwing the ball back into the, into your side of the court, I think as ranchers, we have, we have done everything within our means to make this work. And we seem to be at the tipping point if it's just too much. So I would ask that all avenues would be explored on, on what can be done to actually get the, this number. The, the objective is 1,800. There's five, 6,000 elk uh, in that country. You know, our neighborhood, like I say, it's not unusual uh, to see 1,200 at a time on your, and it's, it, it's crushes you when you're out there feeding hay and looking at that or the next fence over. We can fence our cows in, but we damn sure can't fence them out. Um, so anyway, I appreciate your time. I just wanted to reiterate that there is a, there's a big problem there. Thank you, Mr. Willis. Thank you. Oh, I can't read that. Chuck Painsky, is that Pacinski? My apologies. Thank you for listening to me today. Uh, I'm not a good public speaker. Uh, I, I got the same problem as these other gentlemen. Uh, I, my grandfather homesteaded up there at Four Corners, Black Hills. 
we have a place down at Lusk. But this elk deal's gotten so far out of hand that it's crazy. Uh, that country used to be a really good place to raise oats. We can no longer raise oats. You know, there's herds of three and four and 500 head will come in and, at night and just demolish it. Two years ago, I had some oats and uh, game more than out of Sundance come up every night and kind of babysit at that, put up cages. He saved half that crop that year. I said, well, I want to turn in damages for the other half. And he said, well, we have no record of you letting in hunters. I don't send in those coupons. I've got a stack of them, 16 bucks a piece. It's a slap in the face. Uh, this deal, today we can probably raise 50 bushel oats up there, dry land deal. And we used to raise probably a couple hundred acres of oats and the rest of it hay. Well, you take 50 bushel at six bucks. That's what oats are now. That's $300 an acre. Uh, we can no longer do that. If we have a little feed lot in Lusk. We have to buy all of our grain now. And uh, this is just getting out of hand. And they'll tell you about access. And I know there's an access problem. And the deal that upsets me, it seems like uh, if you're in business, you've got a problem, you work around that problem. And uh, it seems like nothing's happening. And I've run some ideas across to, to our game warden, and I know he probably can't do anything, but, uh, and everybody will tell you about this access deal. We'll ask our local game warden, when have you seen a herd of uh, 400 or 500 bulls? And it's just, you don't. So they're getting a kill on bulls, uh, in my mind. I'm sure there's bulls who go out and hide, they don't hang with the cows, but there's never ever a big herd of bulls. They're not there. So you guys got to figure out some way to kill these cows. And uh, I don't know quite what that is, but you need to start working on it. I'm not saying more licenses is the answer. Give them two cows for a license or something. In Wisconsin, they have, uh, they call it earn a buck. You have to shoot two does before you can shoot a buck deer. Uh, I don't know what the answer is, but something needs to be changed. Um, I would say raise this landowner deals. Uh, had a gentleman stop in this morning, a, a business deal, South Dakota. He put in for an elk license, $1,200. My cut would be, if he comes hunting, would be 16. Is that fair? I don't think so. But anyway, I'll make this short. And, uh, everybody you talk to says, well, we're working on it. Well, change is coming too slow. And, uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't mind sitting down with the locals and, and let's get going on something. Uh, and I'm not quite sure what that'd be, but it, it needs to start soon. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chuck. Mr. Farthing. I'll keep this brief. Thank you, commissioners, for hearing us. My name's Charlie Farthing. I'm in Hunt Area 6 for elk in the Iron Mountain area. My family's been in Laramie County since 1886 in the ranching business. We've been at Iron Mountain since 1903 when my grandfather bought that ranch. My grandfather never saw elk on our ranch. My father, Merrill, never saw elk until the mid 1970s, about 1975. I'm going to give you a little bit of the history of the Iron Mountain elk herd. They were transplanted into the area in 1973 on the Plumbago Canyon Ranch by the Game and Fish. The Plumbago Canyon Ranch was owned by Tom and Kathleen Moore. Tom worked for the Game and Fish Commission. 
There was no environmental impact statement at that time. There was no notification of the neighboring ranchers. Nobody asked us if we wanted them. Uh, they just dumped them out. The game and fish biologist at that time was Bill Hepworth. When confronted with this, the game and fish for years denied that they transplanted elk in our area. However, one of our neighbors, Dr. William Schaefer, who uh, was a neighbor to the Plumbago Canyon Ranch, happened to be going to town at the time when the game and fish were unloading them on the county road. These records were eventually to, discovered by the game and fish that the elk had indeed been transplanted into the area. The game and fish said that the elk had not survived the transplant, that there were no longer any elk in the area. It's kind of like the wolves in Yellowstone. They looked on the Plumbago Canyon Ranch where they dumped them out and they weren't there. They'd gone to the neighbors. Evidently, the elk didn't know where the boundary was. We uh, at first thought this is kind of nice to see a little bunch of elk, 15 or 20. We feel that this area though has been mismanaged for ever since the inception of it. The original objective, I believe, and you can look this up in your records, started out as 300 elk. Then it was raised to 500, to 800, to 1,000. Now our objective is 1,800 head, or your objective, I should say, is 1,800 head. We think we're so far past this, it, it, it's laughable. Uh, the game and fish flew a couple of weeks ago. They flew with a helicopter for three hours. They counted 3,000 head, and they only flew a small part of the area. This Area 6 goes, as, as you know, from the state line of Colorado, back across I-80 to the Ninth Street Road, up into the Iron Mountain area and to the Seville area. It, it, it is a big area. It's bordered by Highway 34 on one side, I-25 on the east side. We, we feel that the 5,000 elk, and we think that is a conservative estimate because they flew it, they counted 3,000, just flying about a third of the area. They were looking, and I talked to the warden that flew. They were merely counting the large bunches of elk. Um, I think we've got a video that one of my neighbors uh, took of a couple of these bunches of elk. Um, and years ago, if we saw 50 or 75, that was something. Now it's not uncommon to see 800 or 1,000 elk. Uh, the biggest bunch we've ever seen on our ranch at one time is about 2,000 in one bunch. If you can look at this back there, that's not brush, that's elk. Um, there's two videos here. There's one of a hunter there. He shot one cow. It's kind of like peeing in the ocean, if you'll excuse me. It makes you feel better, but in the grand scheme of thing, it didn't do anything. We have worked with the Game and Fish for years. We, we brought this to their attention numerous times at meetings. We've sent through endless slideshows, uh, presentations of what you can do for hunting. We now have the longest hunting season, in, I believe, in the state. It's six months long. It's still going. It started in August. There's an unlimited number of licenses. Uh, there's still licenses available. You can go out here to the counter in the front and get a license today uh, till the end of the season for a cow. We uh, are losing our deer has been alluded to, alluded to earlier. Uh, the deer herd in, Iron, in the Iron Mountain area, we used to brag about the big bucks that we had, the number of deer that we had. If you talk to your biologist now, they say none of these deer survive past about three or four years old, or the bucks anyway. Uh, our, our deer population it has a lot of problems with the CWD, with the mountain lions, but we also have the elk taking over the habitat. We've got had so much damage over the years. We've got some uh, handouts and pictures here that my wife will pass out. I'm sorry, I only have one set of pictures. 
but we have a handout of what it's costing us to run these elk. And I believe if you'll look at the figures, we, we figure that we could probably run 150 additional steers for what elk, for the elk that we have running on us all the time. Uh, an example of our lost income, if you figure a yearling steer price at, at our 2021 price of $1,434 a head times 150 yearling steers, that comes to $215,100 in lost income to us. Now, if you figure the cost to run these steers in the Laramie area at $20 to $25 per head, depending on who cares for them, and an example, $20 a head would be the cheap end of it, where if I rent pasture at $20 a head, I probably fix a fence, I probably put out the salt and the mineral, I uh, take care of them. $25 would be for the pasture rent, for the labor, the salt, the mineral, and the maintenance of fences. If the game and fish were to pay for these costs of running the same amount of elk instead of steers, 150 head of elk at $25 a head comes to $3,750 a month times 12 months is $45,000 annually. I don't know about you, but that's a heck of a loss of income to, to us and not many businesses can survive this for very long. Now, we, we're in an area that is mostly private land uh, there's very little uh, public land as far as national forest or anything like that. The only uh, national forest would be the Pole Mountain area up here to the west of us. I don't think there's been an elk on there or very few in the years, the last few years because of all the uh, people that are up there uh, nonstop. But something has got to be done. I think it's going to be very unpalatable to you the solutions, you, you've issued the licenses, you, you can't sell them all. Um, this elk herd is increasing. If you double this population every four to five years or however long it takes to double, and we have 5,000 now, and then we have 10,000, then you double that. We're, we're talking a real problem here. I, I don't know what you're gonna do with it. I have some recommendations, none of which you'll like. I think the only thing you can probably do is go in there with a chapter 56 permit with game and fish personnel and kill a lot of these elk. And even if you do get it down to objective, you've got to be able to continue to manage it for years to come, which you have not done in the past. This should have been addressed 20 years ago. And basically what the game and fish has done is ostracize it. You've buried your heads in the sand. You've ignored it. You've let it grow and grow and grow to the point we're at now. Anyway, that's about the end of my talk. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Any questions for Mr. Farley? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Magagna? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You've heard from several people with the severity of the problem. And I would simply say that I hear that in various parts of the state. It's certainly not unique to the one or two areas that were addressed here today. As I look at the remedies that you have available to you from landowner licenses to depredation hunts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the question I pose today to you and, and to us as an industry is, do you have the tools you need to address this? Uh, of the tools that are out there, the, the only one that would appear to have perhaps applicability when it's gotten this far out of hand is to move in for just with lethal take and just have your own representatives going out there and removing numbers of elk, hopefully uh, harvesting that product and putting it into a, a food program or something like that. But uh, I, we, we just fail to see at this point in some of these key areas how any of these other remedies that you have, depredation hunts depend on more access than you have today. Um, licenses, same thing. With cows, that simply doesn't do it. So uh, the, the thing that I would make a point of is that one, that this has to be addressed. We've heard a lot of talk about how much it's costing a landowner each year for lost revenue because they have to buy added pasture or they can't run the number of cattle that their ranching operation is set up for. The other part of that that perhaps wasn't as much mentioned is 
the long-term resource damage that can be done by these excessive numbers. And I think back to a, a comparable situation where we work very closely with game and fish, and that's with the wild horse issue in, in Western Wyoming, where we're on the same page all the time talking about the fact that those horses in such excessive numbers when they're out of control are doing permanent damage to the resource. They're harming wildlife habitat. They're harming grazing. Uh, in these parts of the state, I think that same scenario is applicable to these elk herds that have simply gotten beyond your ability to control them. So uh, just my, my question or my, my plea to you today would be to take this issue on as a major challenge to the commission, to the department. Uh, if you feel you can address it and are able to do something in a meaningful time frame within your current regulatory regimen and, and statutory authority, that's great. But if, if it's going to take an additional grant of authority or funding, whatever that may be, to the department that you don't currently have. Uh, speaking for Wyoming Stock Board, we're more than committed to going with you before the legislature to give you the tools you need because we think every year that this is delayed, the ability to solve the problem just becomes more of a challenge. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I just urge you to make this a priority and would be happy to try to answer any questions if you have any. Any questions for Mr. McGagan? No, thank you. And I'd like to thank everyone that's came and presented yesterday and today at the task force. I think we could have the same conversation if we had it in Buffalo, if we had it in a variety of areas in the state, especially Eastern Wyoming. And I don't know if, if, if maybe we could establish some type of a working group or something like that between these types of landowners in the department and think of other ideas because it's a huge problem getting bigger as I agree it's hundred percent it's getting bigger and our ability to stay ahead of it is declining some of it by land ownership and people moving into our area and not allowing hunting and exercising their right for private property and not letting anybody on well it affects other people it also affects uh, our public lands it affects the the bighorn mountains it affects some of these other areas where these elk have refuges off the mountain, go onto the mountain and start destroying willows and a whole lot of other things. So it, it's, it's far reaching and we need to do something. There's absolutely, my opinion, 100%. Yeah. Uh, is that something we can do? Is, is try to form some type of working group, whatever you call it, to maybe address and look into Things you never even thought of. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's been, there's been a lot of good discussion today about the fact that this isn't a new problem. And the, the department, as well as many of the landowners in this room, as well as some of the organizations like Mr. McGagnus, have had a lot of discussion about the solution. And it is not an easy one. It's very, very difficult. And so I think that, you know, maybe the idea of, including some of the landowners that are here. There's others that I'm well aware of, along with some department folks to see, you know, to explore any kind of new ideas. I mean, there's obviously, uh, we, we've talked before about um, additional compensation, essentially paying for elk as Mr. Reyes um, identified. That has its problems. You know, that one of the concerns I have there is then do we further disincentivize the elk refuges from ever wanting to provide access if, if, you know, in their view, the problem solved because my neighbor's getting paid. I think that there's certainly an issue with um, agency removal and at a very large scale. Um, but I, I guess, you know, we're at a point as you've all highlighted and, and you've highlighted Mr. President where we have to be willing to explore any and all options. And I think, you know, the other thing is, is that we've, you know, we, we need to look beyond, Mr. McGagna kind of brought this up, we need to look beyond maybe um, not the authorities, but the resources that we have existing and, and available to us right now. And maybe there's some options there. I don't know. Well, we won't know unless we try. So um, any other comments? Commissioner uh, Roberts? Um, is there any way, one, one of the things, one of the one of my fears is something like these folks have a specific problem and uh, and there's a lot of wisdom coming from them. And is there any way that this commission could uh, 
uh, appropriate some of our commission money to whether a uh, University of Wyoming or some sort of graduate to uh, to kind of condense it all into kind of so we know where we're going with this before we start uh, uh, taking everybody's time to go to all these different workshops and stuff. Is, is there any way we could get a uh, uh, some sort of a grad student or something to meet with these folks to travel to get their you know the lay of the land to talk to them before we do it but so it doesn't get kind of my biggest fear is kind of like something get pushed aside and not addressed uh, obviously it's been a boiling point and uh and i don't i like the idea of moving on it instead of keeping everybody oh we're going to do something later i want to, if we start something you know as soon as we can yeah i, I think you know everything's on the table in my opinion and so i mean i think we direct the department to to look in a, a, a way to do this and get back to us and start working on it. Yeah, and I think what we'll do, Mr. President, is we will, um, we will report back to the commission at your next scheduled meeting, which is some, it's like, I think the third week of March. Makes sense. Well, we sure appreciate you coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think we are going to take 10 and we will probably resume with item number eight. Thank you. Oh Lord. We're gonna do eight. Is that what he said? Eight. Oh boy. We skipped John. Mr. Edberg. Commissioner President Duby, Commissioners Director Nesnick, our next agenda item is a damage claim appeal for Claim number 21031, uh, Megan Lally uh, submitted a damage claim for damage to sheep uh, by mount lines in the amount of $38,924. Uh, Kim Olson, our bags game warden, investigated that damage and recommends a payment of $3,084, which is in line with commission regulation on, a, on allowing the application of, of multipliers. With us today, we have uh, Kim Olson, the bag scheme warden again, who, who investigated this claim representing the department will present the department's uh, investigation and recommendation. And we have Mr. Pat O'Toole um, from Ladder Livestock Company who will be representing um, the uh, claimant in this appeal. Um, if there's no questions from the commission at this time, I'd ask Mr. Pat O'Toole to come up and present his uh, claim information um, and uh, as in the past commission, we'll be able to ask questions and then we'll turn it over to Ward Olson and then um, continue on from there. Any comments, questions at this time? Mr. Please, please come forward. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity, Mr. Director, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, I'm Pat O'Toole. Um, we're ranchers in the Little Snake River Valley. Um, my wife is here, Sharon. My granddaughter, Siobhan, and her friend, uh, Siobhan's our oldest grandchild. She is a freshman at the University of Wyoming. And uh, Megan Lally, who's mentioned in this, is my daughter. Um, and we made a claim. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about what happened to us, um, not last summer, but the summer before. But first, I'll, I'll tell you a little story about my, we have three children. Two of them are at the ranch. One we call our non-ranching daughter. And she was having her first job. She was a journalist and she got a job at Madison Avenue working um, on PR. And she called me and she said, you know, she's got a kind of a strong personality. She said, Grandpa, I'm, or Dad, I'm, I'm nervous. This is, you know, Harvard and Yale and all these high-end people. And this is my first day. And I said, Bridget, you go in there tomorrow and say, my name is Bridget O'Toole and I can castrate with my teeth. And that'll just kind of even things out a little bit. And, and it gave her confidence. And, and I say that because we're old school. We're a cowboy deal. And we do things with horses. We couldn't do them with four wheelers, wheelers if we wanted to. <clears throat> and so in the winters of 2018 and 19, uh, we run sheep, cattle, and yearling cattle. Uh, try to be diversified. We have a hunting operation. Um, we've worked with you guys lots. We're in the Chain Lakes allotment. <clears throat> That's our uh, grazing allotment. And in 2018, it was horrible. 2019, we had to leave and go up to northern Wyoming because the snow was so bad. <clears throat> Those winters killed most of your deer in our part of the country. And 
it breaks my heart. You know, our, our family is enrolled in the uh, migration route. We have private land on the migration route that we're putting a conservation easement. Um, we're the ones that on Battle Mountain, when it was the hunting was disappearing because uh, four wheelers, um, Senator Hicks, myself, and and others got together with you guys and the Forest Service and made it a walk-in area. We put private land in there so people can go back and forth across the the uh, the mountain. And so we've we've been cooperators and we want to be cooperators and we believe in the wildlife part just like we do the livestock part. But we have to make it all work. Um, thanks. <clears throat> And in 2020, it didn't work at all for us. And so we came in here, made a claim on lambs. And what's happening is because of the loss of wildlife, the predators are, are changing all of their um, activity. And, and then you have another issue. The Little Snake River crosses the state line 32 times. That means that our valley is half Colorado and half Wyoming. And so we deal with Colorado just like we do Wyoming. And, and it's complicated. It's complicated when you have animals that are going back and forth across the line. And Mr. Nesvik has this working idea of how we work. And, and, it, and, and the problem we have with Colorado is they are completely, completely unable to deal with their bear situation. The numbers are so phenomenal that it's having a huge impact on our operation. And I have pictures I've shown to various ones of you all about Colorado bears with ear tags in our on our side in Wyoming and the numbers are just out of control. And we've seen that before movement of wildlife across the line and, and more licenses meant we finally kind of got ahead of it and, it and it got better. But the combination of that and, and the bad winters of 18 and 19 in the, in the spring of 20, we started having bears in our lambing ground, which is different from our home ranch. And they were, they were eating lambs like candy. And we made a claim and the claim was based on um, comparing docking. We have several, several bunches of sheep and we compared docking where the bears were and docking where the <coughs> bears weren't. And, and the numbers were significant. And you made an award that I thought was um, not good. I didn't feel like it was good. And, and, and I wasn't at the meeting, I was on a Zoom call. And, and so I'm here and this is really a long time and I appreciate you get me in today because I got to do something else tomorrow. And, and I appreciate um, you letting me put this off because I wanted to talk to you in person about what we saw. So not only did we have bears eating the lambs at numbers that were just totally out of control. Um, you know, the, the poet Tennyson has a line, nature red and tooth, tooth and claw. And those of you all that know what the wildlife world and the ranching world is like, it isn't pretty. It isn't always just, you know, Disney world. The worst thing to me is, is when you have a bear um, eat the milk out of a bag of a ewe and then leave her alive. And to go up to that ewe and see um, two twins standing there and her just gushing blood, that's real. That's what the real world is like. And that's what our world was like in the spring of 2020 when we made a claim and, and your perspective wasn't, was that it wasn't a good claim. And I have to tell you that um, in our little community, we're all in the community together, but we have a lot of disagreement right now with your organization and our, the way we're looking at things. And, and so that went by and we, you know, ha had it happen and we lost a lot of lambs. So later in the summer, we, had, we have cattle on Battle Mountain. We run cattle on Battle Mountain. We celebrated our 140th anniversary this year of the Ladder Ranch. We've been there a long time. This is this year was the first year in history we didn't run cows and calves on Battle Mountain because of the losses we incurred the year before, because the the bears were in such numbers that they were killing calves. We didn't make a claim on those calves, even though our uh, fish or our uh, trapper saw a bear kill a calf and. And we, find, we didn't realize it till fall when we brought them in and our numbers were so bad. And we didn't, so we didn't make a claim on that. <coughs> but we raise all our own genetics. I mean, we just, our own dogs, our own horses, our own uh, bucks and our own bulls. And, and so we have a purebred bunch of both Rambouillet and Hampshire sheep that we lamb. 
we'll start lambing in May or in March, excuse me, but our major lambings in May. And we do it as a family. We raise those purebred because we want the genetics we want. We have black face, white face. We have some of the finest wool in the United States because we're raising the genetics that we want. So we turn those, I think it's 40 or 44 um, buck lambs. So they were born in March. A year later, <coughs> in, in May, we turned them out into the mountain. We've turned them in our whole lives. East of the house, not very far away. Good grass, good water. And later in the, in the summer, I went up there partway in a four-wheeler and I saw three of these big 150-pound dead Rambouillet rams. I thought, what is this? And so we started looking for them. And typically, we're riding horseback and you see them. And nobody had seen them. Nobody had seen any of them. And so we started looking pretty hard. We brought in the trapper. And at the same time, we killed a lion that had killed a 300-pound uh, ram. He was actually climbing a fence with a 300-pound ram in his mouth. Um, and, and we started looking. And we found the evidence of uh, 13, 14, 15 rams. That's what our trapper, I talked to him day for yesterday. And we made a claim of uh, 38,000 that you just mentioned. And we're awarded three. Those rams all died from those lions. That's what happened. And everybody, the trapper knows it, our family knows it, and I believe your employee knows it. But we did not get, receive compensation. So we're appealing that because it's, it's that important to us. We didn't claim the, the calves. And so what we did last year, because we're not people that don't react to crisis, we didn't run any cows and calves on Battle Mountain. We ran yearlings. And, and what we saw the year before that was, should have been a good clue to us, those cows wouldn't stay on the mountain. They just were busting through friends, fences to get into our, gra our hay meadows um, because they were so afraid of those bears. We didn't really understand what was going on. At the same time, we've got lions because they don't have deer to eat, eating rams. And so it's cause and effect. We want to have, bear, we wanna have um, uh, those deer that should be up there. You know, I've bragged about the balance between our lions and, and, and uh, deer for my whole lifetime. You know, I speak around the country on, on production and conservation issues. And I always said, boy, what a great thing. We know we have lions and got deer, but we don't have problems with our livestock. Well, now we do because there's no deer. And, you know, last week I went out to our desert country west of Bags in Colorado. And there's probably a thousand deer out there that I saw. And I'm excited that they'll make their way up, but they're not in our country. They're not. And they're not there because the predators are dominating the system. So we've got Colorado bears coming up. We've got lions without, without food. And, and it's just not, it's a wreck. And, and I guess I'm appealing to your sensibility of, of knowing that this isn't Disneyland. This is the real world out here. And we not only had to replace those rams, more money than the 38,000 that we asked for, but we lost the genetics. And that hole in our production for a year is really serious for us. And, you know, we got some lambs that will now be in uh, next year. And, and what we've done is we've, uh, instead of running those ram lambs or yearling rams up on that hill, which costs us nothing on our own land, we have them in it on the meadows now. Costs us a lot of money. We bring them every night and we still had lions killing lambs in the meadows. And we, instead of having those cows and calves up on, uh, on, our, on our forest permit, they were on our meadows and in other places. And that cost us a bunch of money, but we couldn't afford to put those cows and calves back up on that mountain. And we couldn't afford to put our lambs uh, back on the mountain either. So there is a problem and what, uh, you know, um, I, I didn't know what I was going to say today because I've thought this talk to you guys a hundred times over the last year about what would I say. But the reality is um, when I learned that every three years you look into what you're going to do for um, licenses for predators, uh, that doesn't work. You know, if, if Putin crosses the line into Ukraine, they're not going to wait year, three years to deal with it. They're going to deal with it now. We have a now problem. And we needed to be killing lions and bears to get ourselves into balance again last year. And there's some hunting going on and we're recruiting anybody that will come and do it. 
<clears throat> but that's a responsibility of you guys. They're your bears. And whether we like it or not, when those bears cross the state line and get into Wyoming, they're your bears. So I'm, I'm appealing to you to relook at our, our claim. And we'd like to have some sense of we're working together on this deal because right now we're paying the price for, um, for the deer herd that got hurt in those terrible winters. So thank you and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. O'Toole right now? Okay, thank you. President Duby, um, Commissioners and Director Nesbick, my name is Kim Olson. I've been with the department for 17 years. And for 11 of those years, I've been the bags game warden. I am here today to explain the discrepancy between the ladder livestock damage claim and the department's recommended payment. We'll start with chapter 28 that governs livestock compensation rules. I'm going to be touching on a few different various parts of chapter 28 today. So the first one is section 3A, and in section 3A, uh, it states that the use of a multiplier may be used in certain circumstances. That is typically used in what we call open range when it is difficult to find missing livestock. Um, the multiplier will not be used today because these damages that occurred occurred in a pasture setting. This is a copy of the claim that was turned in. Um, as you can see on line one is the number that were confirmed and verified, and that is two. Uh, on line two, she states the number that she is missing in addition to that, and she has an additional 30 for a total on line three of 32 total sheep. Now, one thing I wanted to point out is that um, a, ch a ch little change was made on this. On line two, she has 20 buck lambs and 10 mature bucks. But then at the bottom, when she makes her, her calculations, she swaps those numbers. Um, however, these are the numbers that we do stick with for the rest of the claim. So I believe that these were the right numbers. Um, instead, it was 10 buck lambs and 20 mature bucks. These are a copy of the affidavits that were filled out by myself and Luke Spanbarrow with Wildlife Services. So on the morning of August 6th, 2020, I received a call from Mrs. Lally stating that she had seen, had found a dead, uh, dead sheep that she saw, thought was a fresh kill. I arrived at the scene, uh, confirmed that it had been killed by mountain lion. And after leaving, I was able to contact Luke Spanbauer with, with Wildlife Services. He, I told him it was a fresh kill. He was very interested. Um, he showed up shortly thereafter. And that's when he found the second dead ram um, which is the livestock affidavit on the right. And then he was also able at that time to take the offending mountain lion. So his, um, yeah, I'll, I'll show it in another photo here in a little bit. So this is the ram that I verified. Uh, you can clearly see the wound in the, in the neck. And again, uh, the knife is marking the two canine uh, marks on the neck that clearly indicate that this was killed by a mountain lion. This is a picture of the pasture in which it was found. So I am standing on the road when I took this photo and the sheep that I verified was literally 50 yards from the road. Um, I believe that the one that Luke Spanbauer found was a little further back, uh, back along the river. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. In the picture you're showing us there, where is the back fence? The back fence of this pasture? Yeah. Right back by the tree I, I think clear back by the trees. I can't really. I'm sorry. I'm asking. Yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. It looks like a. All right. Thank you. Okay. So in our in our calculations, um, we again chapter chapter twenty eight section three a states that we cannot pay beyond the known death loss. So the death loss in this case is the two rams. Um, we agreed upon the price of $1,542. That was documentation that Mrs. Lally had brought stating that they had sold some other rams for that price. So we agreed upon that. So the two rams, um, it comes to a total of $3,084. Uh, 
We do not use the multiplier in this case because these damages occurred in the pasture setting. <laughs> so we have the two mature bucks. Uh, no buck lambs were ever verified killed by uh, mountain lions. So we cannot offer payment for those damages because they were never verified. So the total recommended payment for the department is $3,084. And to show the, uh, the two differences. So we offer payment for the two bucks. She asks for payment for the two bucks as well as the 20 other mature bucks at a total of $33,924. We do not offer payment for the two buck, uh, for the missing buck lambs because none were verified. She asks for payment of the buck lambs at $500 a piece of a total of $5,000 for a total claim of $38,924, uh, a difference in the claim of $35,840. Are, the, are there any questions? President Doobie. Commissioner Roberts. Um, so the, the big discrepancy is were these, were these sheep all on the pasture setting that we're supposed to? So if there's, are they, um, I just find it hard to see how we have such a huge discrepancy between two versus what, 20 or whatever. I, I believe the bucks were on the pasture setting, but the buck lambs were up in, in another, uh, another, I don't want to say allotment, but another pasture further up the canyon. So the bucks and the buck lambs were in separate, separate well, places. private pasture, both sides. I'm yeah. not sure if that's a private pasture or if it was BLM. Okay. What is it? Uh, he would like to answer that. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, I was just, I was just trying to get the clarification between the two, how we'd be so far apart. And it's so that there was nothing verified on the 20, but just the two. Why did he, was there any reports on the 20 before that no, like our sheep gone or something's been in there or did we get any reports prior to that? So the only sheep that I were, was asked to look at were the, the one that I had gotten called on that morning that I arrived at. And then uh, it was happenstance that Luke Spanbauer found the second one on when he returned to, you know, when he returned to the scene and then he was looking for the mountain lion um, is when he found the second one. That, that was the only, those were the only bucks that I was asked to look at. When you had asked me, uh, I, I will explain the buck lambs. Um, I was asked, or when I finally heard about the buck lambs and I'd asked him if I needed to come see them, he did inform me that there was not enough to look at and then I wouldn't be able to verify them. So I never did go verify or look at any buck lambs. Uh, yeah, I, I'm still kind of confused, but if we, uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, just another quick historical deal. I was a state legislator a long time ago. My first week was 1986. That was my first week. And it was, I don't know if y'all are old enough to remember 202, the bill that Senator or uh, Representative Grant and Hageman, uh, Harriet Hageman's father, put in about uh, licenses for ranchers. And I was asked to be on that bill as a freshman and, and several people said, you don't wanna be there. And it was horrible, it was hateful. And with the Herschler building and the Capitol, the whole Herschler building, big um, place that we had an auditorium was full of people and all the way out between the Capitol and the Herschel building filled with hunters. And it was the low point in my experience in Wyoming between the hunter community and the rancher community. And I've spent my whole life trying to figure out how we can work together. And the, the pasture picture she took across the way is where the lambs were, the buck lambs. And it's about a thousand acre, more or less sagebrush pasture that we have used our entire life to turn those rams in. And I'm the one that found the first three that indicated they were gone. 
I don't know what, you know, I'm just gonna be honest with you. If this fellow here was working in our community, we'd, we wouldn't have an issue. I've never met him before, but I listened to what his, what his relationship with, with uh, Representative Summers and, and his community is. We don't have that. And Luke Spanbauer told me two days ago that he had enough evidence of 14, but we don't have cooperation. And that's a problem. And my daughter, Megan, when I said I was gonna come here, no matter what, I wanted to look at you guys in the eye and talk to you. Um, she said, dad, they won't do anything. She's so disgusted with it. And we took a tremendous loss on our lambs that spring with bears that we didn't get verified. We took a tremendous loss on calves with bears on Battle Mountain that I told you about, we didn't make a claim. I have a beautiful um, picture here of 150 elk that I took just before the snowfall this year, going from the, the shade into the sunlight in a pasture that I was trying to save for next spring and the driest year we've ever had. We don't make claims like that. We're not trying to run you guys into more claims than you can handle, but the right is right and wrong is wrong. And we took a tremendous loss here. We don't feel like we have enough cooperation to justify the kind of um, relationship we have with you guys. And I, I, I feel bad. I don't want to have this kind of conversation with you, but this isn't right. And we took a big loss and it's a loss that, you know, not only of our live animals, but our genetics. Okay. I'd like to start over. Anybody else have a problem with that? Proceed, Mr. President. Um, the 10 buck lambs that we are not having any compensation for, were they not verified at all? No, One. They were not Second verified. question, were they in a pasture setting? No, they were not in a pasture setting. Those were up the canyon that he was talking about. Um, I would definitely say that it was more of a range situation. They were not verified nor confirmed because when he told me about them and I'd asked them if I needed to go look at them, he stated that they were already too far gone and that I would not be able to verify them. Okay, so let's play what if here. If you, somebody would have found one or two of those buck lambs in a non-pasture setting, open range, our multiplier would have been what? Three. Three. If, if we'd have confirmed one, the multiplier would have been three, correct. All right. So in, in that setting, if they, if you would, if you had verified 10 buck lambs and we used a multiplier of 30, however, we can't pay more than they lost. Correct. So they're really only claiming to have lost 10 buck lambs in a open range setting. Correct. Okay. All right. So everybody follow me. <laughs> oh, you're helping a lot. Yes. Thank so you. on the, the, the upper one on the pat on the, uh, the cheer bucks, that you found or whoever uh, verified and that was in a pasture setting. Correct. So the other 20 missing buck sheep, they were, where were they at? They were not in that same pasture? So, so according to Mr. O'Toole, yeah, could you please come up here? So we, so we it's easier to, the two that were confirmed were in a pasture setting. Is that cor correct? The 20 that weren't that you're claiming that you lost were not in that same pasture. No, they were in a, They were in an open range setting. Situation. And I found three myself. That's the first indication we had. I was up there in a four wheeler. I kind of got hurt. I haven't been riding horseback for a couple of years. And I find these three Ramble A 150 pound lambs, lamb boom, 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 right next to each other. That doesn't happen. Mr. O'Toole, why didn't, why didn't you have the game warden go look, even if you said they were? Because part of it, I think, is I've turned most of our operation over to my kids, and our son does the cattle, and our Megan does the, the sheep. And I told Megan, and Megan communicates with, uh, with the game and fish. I don't. So maybe there was some missed. You can understand the pickle we're in regarding that. Yes, sir, I do. But right is right. Well, I'm not arguing right or wrong. No. I'm just trying to well, figure out where all so, these critters so were. If the trapper was here, and he's in a tough situation because he works for another agency. Everybody's trying to not step on each other's toes. You know how it is. I understand that. And, and it's he, also and difficult for our, our personnel. He if told they're me not the actually actually go confirm a lamb. Yes, sir. 
that yes, it's hard to. Is. He told me day before yesterday, he thought there was, because we rode, we had cowboys riding that thing for days and found rem remnants of about 14 mm -hmm. that were ones that we found pieces of. But, and, you know, it's just like uh, um, Mr. Summers was talking about. It doesn't take two days for stuff to disappear in the summertime in our country just disappear no i fully understand that so uh, yeah, what, I don't... What we're what we made a claim just like on the cows we didn't make a claim for everything that we think we lost we made a claim for what was a reasonable assessment of what we thought we could claim in an honest way so that we would get some remuneration for our losses okay thank you anybody have any other questions i i do mr president what are we tied to what is what you observe out there i mean i don't I'm, i'd have to ask jenny are we are we tied to what what the regs say we can't just go on and say okay we'll give them 10 more lambs or something isn't it don't they have to be verified Uh, the regulations do require that you have a confirmed verification kill in order for the multiplier to apply. And so that is by your regulation. So what you're saying is if we just handed him more money, we're breaking the law. Not, that's not entirely true. Uh, we have the ability as a commission to award whatever we deem proper. You do have that ability. Um, I would recommend, should you do that, that you are able to back it up with the more likely than not that something happened. Um, an excellent example is in the Crandall Creek case where there were two animals that were known to be injured in some way. And uh, there you were able to make that conclusion of more likely than not, um, you know, that there, there was a damage or something like that. Well, we, I would we, encourage you to. We would be it foolish to, to just take his word for it. And... I completely apologize. I am completely talking out of turn. Um, I please ignore everything I just said. I apologize. I stepped out. I apologize. Um, I stepped out of turn. Please ignore everything I just said. For you to get legal advice, I recommend that you go into executive session and call your other attorney at this time. I, I apologize. I, I was not thinking. Please disregard everything I just said, please. <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> Warden Olson, if is it more likely than not that those excuse me. Um, excuse me, would you please go into executive session to correct the mistake I just made and speak with your other attorney? That's what would be appropriate. Disregard what I just said please call your other lawyer. Is, is that appropriate? That's only appropriate if we choose to ask an attorney to go into it. If we choose not to and he's satisfied with... Yes, but I just you, gave is you... That, is that procedure that we need to do? Would you, uh, would you please go into executive session okay. so you can have a third party um, advise you on this? Mr. And erase whatever I've just Mr. Said. President, I would move that we go into executive session. Thank you. I'll second that. Moved by Commissioner Rockert, second by Commissioner Ladwick to go into executive session. Thank you. Okay. Does the commission have any more questions? Rainy. Where do we start? Mr. President, I do have some more broke up. I have I need some clarification. The department found and confirmed two mature rams those are the confirmed kills that is correct two mature bucks rams i don't run sheep i don't know what they're called and because i feel the claimant has credibility what did he say he found when he was out in the pasture three rams Three buck ewes, three. <laughs> what? <laughs> what were those? We have some hermaphrodites. This is a nomenclature issue, and I apologize for getting a little hot. You know, I mean, this is an important issue, guys. So, um, but what I found were were three eighteen month old Rambouillet 
rams. Okay, that's what I found. And that was the beginning of, hey, something's wrong here. You know, where are the rest? We started looking, we didn't find anything else. And the ones in the pasture is a co almost completely different deal. That's, a, that's not the ones that we typically turn out and just leave all summer and pick up in the fall. That's a different, that's a different deal. Well, for us, it's where they were, where they were. Yes, sir, I understand. <clears throat> And Mr. President, question for Mr. O'Toole. Those three yearling rams have a value of $500 per head. We couldn't replace them for that. But if that's, that's what, what made you quit, that's what's okay. I'm just making sure I have yes, the, sir. the right animals to the right lines now. <clears throat> um, hold on, says Commissioner Ladwig, are you still? That completes my question. Thank you. The, the, three, the three rams that you said you found, are they're comparable to the two that were confirmed? Uh, no, they would be like a year, at least a year younger. Okay, thank you. Yeah, they're this number. The two that we've confirmed and that we have offered to pay for are ma mature buck sheep. That's my understanding. Uh, he only threw three. Right. Any more questions? Any more testimony? More than Olson? Good. I'd entertain a motion. Mr. President, I, I apologize. I'm just not sure where on the claim. Where are the other 20 missing buck sheep? So my cowboys found evidence in our trapper, who we really have a lot of faith in, thought that there were 13, 14 that, you know, that they, he, he said he found the remnants of. That they were, had, their had remnants passed. were found, but they weren't verified. That's right. And those are the buck sheep. Those yes, are adults. Yearling rams. So that would, if we went with that, we'd go with the two confirmed and then 13 that your trapper confirmed, yes, sir. which is happens to be Luke, is that correct? Yes, sir. Who is a subcontractor for the Game of Fish Department. Correct. Not exactly how we do things, but confirmed by somebody of our employees, so to speak. Correct. Right. Well, I think we're going to play the game So as far as the bucks, I'm just trying to compile some things. You guys have jumped in if you want it. So if we did that with the two confirmed by the warden and 13 confirmed by Luke, that would be 15 confirmed missing buck sheep. Yes, sir. Mr. President, do we have uh, any uh, uh, Luke? Does he do any verified app? Uh, did he, on these extra 13, did he do any kind of verified affidavit of them? Not that I can see. We were, we, if we're going to go that route, it's under, it's under the more likely than not. I'm, that's a suggestion. My question would be, why, why didn't he verify them? Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, this, this is what's called a sticky wicket. There's a lot of moving parts here, and and he's trying to be, you know, helpful to us figuring out something. And I will go back to what I told you. We completely changed our operation on cows and sheep because of this predator stuff that we had in 2020. So we're trying to fix it. We're not going. Oh, we're going to keep doing the same thing. We're trying to fix it. That we need help from you to fix it. And when I have sat through all the stuff and in Pinedale and what's going on in the Green River. Two of those cowboys that are the verifiers used to work for us. We know a lot about what's going on up there. We need the same kind of scrutiny and help in our part of the country till we figure this thing out and get our deer back and figure out what we're gonna do about Colorado bears. I'm just trying to give you, just like everybody has done today, we wanna help you get to a place where we're more effective. And that's what we would like to have happen. Oh, we appreciate that. Yes, sir. but we're trying to deal with this. It's just right. trying to be fair to you and fair to the, our system that's been in place for many years. 
this and, and be true to our employees that, that do an outstanding job and trying to make sure we do the right thing. Yes. I have a question Mr. for Longwell. Gordon Olson. What um, communication have you had with Travis about these additional remnants that were found? Yes. Sorry. Travis, never mind. Yes, Luke, thank you. I don't know if I've spoken with Luke about the additional. Oh. I'm not sure I've spoken with Luke about what he had found as far as the remnants or what pieces he had found of, of those other four, 14 sheep. Okay. So yeah. he, hadn't, he hasn't shared that information with you at all? No, not really. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to provide some additional input here over this. Luke's that would be helpful. And contract work. So, because I think it's key. The contract we have with wildlife services is very clear that any work they do for us is on our direction and under our guidance and our approval and part of that is that they report back to our employees on what they found and that which requires written documentation of any and all large trophy game damage that they found through that live doc affidavit process and that's in place to make sure we're all on the same page and what is verified and what confirmed is what not and what's done under the direction of the department and paid by the department versus conversations that happen at a later date where we have no documentation of exactly what was investigated and what was found to be the to the to cause the death. And that's kind of pretty technical, but um, that's what our contract says with wildlife services and that's what required and that's what we require across the state. And so that's it. it's been a solid standard that we've held to these livestock affidavits it's not new we've done it for probably 20 years and that's that's part of this deal is you tell us what you found and we trust you but you've got to follow up with this on what what you found and what killed them with a piece of paper and i that maybe it's bureaucratic to think but it's what we've everybody's agreed to that's involved in this thing to, to do this with wildlife services and department i think that's a key part of this is coming back later and doing something verbally without us being able to confirm that or look at it does play into this and I just wanted to clarify that. <clears throat> Mr. President, I'm not ready for a motion, but I'm getting closer. Commissioner Brokaw. <clears throat> Was that a statement or? <laughs> <laughs> I'm slow here. I'm trying to get my sheep terms in order sheep in a row. <laughs> the adults were not eligible for a multiplier we confirmed two of them dead more likely than not the three yearling rams that were found outside of that pasture were also killed by trophy predator a multiplier of three to one would apply to those yearling rams that mr o'toole found physically found laying in a row dead Is that correct? Is that correct? Say it again, please. Uh, so the multiplier doesn't apply to the two mature bucks that were confirmed lion kills. You went on your four wheeler, you found three yearling rams outside that pasture in another bigger area, three dead in a row. Does our multiplier apply to those 18 month old sheep? Perhaps that's a question for Warden Olson. If they had been verified, then yes, the multiplier would have applied to that open situation. But because they weren't verified, the multiplier does not apply. Correct. Well, it's not even that. It, it, it's not even a kill. Right, exactly. Because, because they weren't verified. I don't know why. We need to, I'm sorry, we need to speak. So because they were not verified, Section 3A of Chapter 28 states that we cannot pay for those because they were not confirmed. Okay. I shot my motion all the pot. <laughs> Start over with someone else. How much is the department willing to, what, what's our claim? Uh, 3,086, is that what it is? 3,084. 84. Well, Mr. President, 
I mean, we've looked at a lot of this, but I think I would move that we pay the department's recommendation just because the others weren't verified. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved by Commissioner Bird, second by Commissioner Jolovich to award the department's recommendation. Correct? Correct. Any discussion? A discussion, Mr. President. Mr. Broca. I think clearly the, the landowner has a very valid claim here in missing stock. I'm still confused on why there's a disconnect between verified findings. I encourage Mr. O'Toole and department personnel for this next season to find a system to verify because I will, I will pay heavily on every verified kill. I'm going to vote. I'm going to rise up against the motion because I think that there's credibility in the claim, the claimant, and more likely than not, there were more of those animals killed, but I don't have a good solution on how to present that yet. Mr. President, if I may, uh, if, if we pay the damage, if we vote to pay the damage claim, he has other avenues, other options. That's right. His, yes, his, his, his option is to accept it or not accept it and file an appeal. Any more questions? More comments? Would you restate your motion again? I will move that we pay the department's recommendation of $3,084. That's already been made. I'm just clarification so that we're all on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not seeing I'm not yet. All right, seeing more discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Aye. So three to two. Did you get that? So we'll have a we'll have a verbal vote. Commissioner Roberts, all right, this is all for um, in favor of the motion. In, I vote I in favor of the motion. Commissioner Jolovich. In favor. Commissioner Ladwig. Nay. Commissioner Bird. In favor. Commissioner Brokaw. Nay. Commissioner Lundball. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank, Thank you. you. Commissioners, good way to end a damage claim career. Thank you for your consideration. And this is a tough job. You get a, a, appointed to a board, you have no idea how much time you spend for most of the time. But, um, you know, in, in, because our operations in two states, there was an issue with people making claims on bear kills in Colorado. And so we developed a process where we have a dated camera, we have a GPS, and we have a photo of every lamb that's killed because the sheep herders are there to find it. We have gone way beyond trying to figure out how to do verification. And the reality is if, if, if your employee doesn't want to verify, it's pretty hard to do. And I'm just telling you from a recommendation of the future, that can't be, I know your culture isn't, don't verify. I know that isn't the department's culture, but it's the culture we're living in. And I can give you five different examples. I'll spend a lot of your time in the room. This isn't right because things are changing. When you don't have any deer and those, and those uh, predators have nothing to do to come after my animals, I have nowhere to go other than I got to put everything in pens every single night. That's what my grandkids did all last summer. Put them in every night. And they even came in the morning after we put them out and killed a few. But, you know, we're out of control. We don't have our deer herding. So what we, our predators are taking our livestock. Well, we appreciate your comments. Thank you, Mr. Thank O'Toole. You. Thank you. I like it. So is that number five? Five, six, and seven. Mr. President, members of the commission, we're at agenda item five. Uh, just some housekeeping here at the November commission meeting. You approved the location uh, for the November commission meeting. Uh, to be in Green River, and we're proposing to do that in Rock Springs. Okay, thought we already did that, but yeah, facilities for meeting and lodging. So, do we need a motion of that? Yep, we do. Right. I'd entertain a motion. I'll make a motion. We go with this change. Second. 
Moved by Commissioner Jolivich, second by Commissioner Lundvall to approve the change to Rock Springs, correct? Or Green River? Yeah, from Green River to Rock Springs. Green River to Rock Springs. Green River to Rock Springs. Yeah. Got it. Just a Date remains the same. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, agenda item six, the commission's heard this before. In fact, commissions have heard this every year. Uh, we're required by statute to get your approval for volunteer projects. So what we have done over the years is worked with the commission actually on putting together a list of proposed volunteer projects. Uh, we've worked on this with the commission. It's all encompassing. Um, and we think we'll capture all the potential volunteer projects that we anticipate moving forward with. And because of the statutory requirement to get your approval, we would like to get your approval of these volunteer programs and projects for 2022. So moved. Second. Been moved by Commissioner Ladwig, second by Commissioner Bowles <coughs> to approve the department's recommendation on volunteer projects. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Agenda item seven uh, is employee housing project in Jackson. And although this is a high priority project of the commission and department, uh, the briefing today is going to be brief. Um, so we have been, we tried to, the commission approved, as you know, um, a couple of meetings ago, a budget capacity to move forward with another well site. Um, we tried to get that done with our, with White Mountain operating um, during the holidays and we did, they were unable to do that. So we've put it up, put everything on the drilling on pause, and we've been spending uh, all of our time working on uh, documentation here in Cheyenne. We finished a contract with Jorgensen Engineering to oversee all the drilling, drilling work by White Mountain Operating. We have finished the amendment to the contract with White Mountain Operating so that when we're ready to get in there and spring and drill as soon as they can, we're going to do that. Um, we're not asking for any more budget. We still have the budget that remains that you saw at the last commission meeting. Um, and we've been spending a lot of time, our services division has been spending time getting all the documentation and uh, project specifications put together. So when we go in and drill in the spring, hopefully that's successful. We have all our paperwork in order to get this thing launched to go out to bid for construction of the houses. That is it. Comments? Thank you. In a couple of commission meetings, maybe at the next commission meeting, we'll have a plan, put together a strategy, how, <coughs> how we propose to go about the actual construction. Okay. Uh, can we kick another one or two? Yes, sir. Mr. Bibby, this will be number nine. Good afternoon, mem uh, Mr. President, members of the commission. Uh, just wanted lands uh, item on the agenda today. The North Gillette Warden Station, the former North Gillette Warden Station, uh, which we were planning on bringing at the last commission meeting, uh, fell out of contract, but we were able to go out in the market and find another buyer. Uh, the offer is a full price offer at $180,000. We are paying some closing costs in the amount of $4,500. And commission to the uh, buyer's agent at two and a half percent, which is an additional $4,500. Uh, we are recommending that the commission vote to move forward with the sale of the property. Uh, closing is scheduled for Friday. Excellent. I saw the uh, real estate agents only taking 2% uh, at 2.5%. Oh, Mr. President. Uh, the buyer's agent, and uh, oh. that that's typical for marketplaces. Yes. My turn. I make a motion. We accept the offer. Second. It's moved by Commissioner Jolovich, second by Commissioner Ladwig to accept the department's recommendation in selling the Gillette Game Warden Station. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's Aye. number 10. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> On schedule. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, President Duby, members of the commission, Director Nesvik, who's not here anymore. <laughs> um, I'm here to present um, license selling agents update. Um, we have at this time, we're asking to approve one new license selling agent, the transfer of one license selling agent, 
and then the renewal of seven licensed selling agents that failed to submit bond paperwork by December 1st. So our new agent that we're requesting is the Chug Chug Gas and Go LLC in Chugwater. And there are no other agents in, our, in Chugwater. Um, the transfer is Aetna Trading Company. And um, we have one other agent in Aetna and the sales of the Aetna Trading Company in 2021 were just over $28,000. Wow. In your commission memo, the next agents, so the North Park Anglers in Walden, Ridley's Family Market in Pinedale, the Wagner Chevron Food Market in Diamondville, the Whitehorse County Store in Thermopolis, the Walmart 3778, which is one of the Casper Walmarts, the West one, the Fast Stop 1136 in Evanston, and the Glendo Trading Post all failed to submit bond paperwork by December 1st. So their terminals were shut off. They were not able to sell licenses beginning January 1st until you guys approve them as agents to continue if you so elect. So, so do we charge them to turn it back on? Commission President, we do not charge them to turn it back on. They are required to submit the $50 bond Just paperwork the bond. that they would have had to have submitted by December 1 um, to continue to be an agent. And in your commission memo, I did outline and we'll be adding this in the future um, for these late bonding as to whether they're on electronic payment processing since we get questions on that frequently from the commission when we present license selling agent information. Is this the first time for some of these? It seems like we've taken action on like the Walmart in the past year or two, there have been some licensing problems. Or is, is this the first time they've been laid on their bond payments? Or is that, does that make any difference? Commission President, um, Commissioner Ladwig. Um, I don't believe these have been late in the past. I do know um, we did have 13 agents that failed to bond by December 1. These are the ones that we've already received their paperwork to bring to this commission. We're still waiting on six others. I believe in that set of six, um, there were a couple, at least one that had failed to bond and were approved last year. They're not on this list. But I don't believe they're on this list. Yeah, thank you. Any more discussion? One. Mr. Roberts? Um, so on the Aetna Trading Company, the 28,000, you mentioned that there's another Aetna place that is selling licenses? Commission President, yes, there is one other ed agent located in Aetna, and I don't have that one off the top of my head. Where is Aetna? Well, Aetna, let me tell you, <laughs> I have some property in Aetna. This is going to take a while. <laughs> <laughs> where, where my original family came from was Aetna. So, uh, we know Adna really well. You didn't tell me where it is. <laughs> well, it's tough to tell. You tell me you're going <laughs> to have to. <laughs> it's long road. <laughs> you're, you're into Jackson. It's along the road. <laughs> so it's it's past. I was just saying, I'm, I'm glad I met you. <laughs> glad I met you, Adna. That's what he said. Okay, I have T-shirts for that. Yeah. Any more discussion? Any kind of motion? I move. I still move. Second. Okay, it's moved by Commissioner Roberts, second by Commissioner Jolovich to accept the department's recommendations on the aforementioned license selling agents. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and is there a call to the public? Is there anybody out there that wants to say their piece? Make it dang quick. <laughs> no, anybody want to say anything? Okay, I have any a motion to adjourn. Second. Uh, moved by Commissioner Lundvall, second by Commissioner Bird to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? See you tomorrow morning. What time tomorrow morning? Eight o'clock. Executive session at eight. We have an executive session at eight. At eight. Yeah,